Aircraft are meant to be airborne. That's where they make money. Passengers expect a smooth journey. After check-in and baggage drop, the ground time is the critical factor where airlines, airports, and ground handlers aim for perfect processes. After landing, more than 200 different steps need to be processed to prepare the aircraft for takeoff again. These steps are preceded by different parties and need to be done in a particular time frame. The logistics is a challenge. In every department, resources such as people and vehicles are limited. And requirements like service level agreements, government regulations, and many others have to be taken into account. Unforeseen circumstances can easily cause flight delays. Dispatchers need to change plans quickly, as a disruption in one process may cause further delays, resulting in a knock-on effect. If staff is not available or machines are broken, penalties might be unavoidable. Just imagine your processes are handled and optimized by using software. GroundStar is your solution. GroundStar delivers value to airlines, ground handlers, and all other stakeholders in the turnaround process. Its end-to-end -end approach supports you in your strategical and tactical planning, and in particular, at the day of operations. GroundStar is aware of all your resources, their locations, and assigned jobs, taking into account not only the travel time, but also the duration of each task. A powerful real-time optimization enables GroundStar to change plans automatically and provide an optimized schedule to efficiently allocate the available resources to the jobs. Let's have a closer look. Greg Groundster is responsible for the baggage handling. In the past, he used Excel sheets, paper, and radio to plan and execute his job. Once in a while, vehicles break down. In an ideal case, other trucks and drivers would be available to take over. If this was not the case, Greg had to check the location and availability of his other resources by radio. Additionally, the amount of baggage, all available trucks, and their travel time must be comprised. Under time pressure, a tricky task. Since GroundStar has been implemented, Greg is able to react to any changes in the plan within seconds. GroundStar considers special requirements and factors them into the strategic planning. On the day of operation, Gray can review all tasks and their pertinent information and assign them to his employees. As disruptions evolve, work processes can be adjusted in real time. And a fully mobile workflow ensures a smooth information flow between all parties. Be a ground star and rely on more than 25 years of worldwide experience. More than 70 organizations at 160 airports already put their trust in our aviation experts. As a ground star, you will reduce costs by up to 30%. You will achieve higher employee satisfaction by up to 95%. And you will boost your efficiency through our powerful optimizer. Find further information at groundstar.aero. Aircraft are meant to be airborne. That's where they make money. Passengers expect a smooth journey. 
After check-in and baggage drop, the ground time is the critical factor where airlines, airports, and ground handlers aim for perfect processes. After landing, more than 200 different steps need to be processed to prepare the aircraft for takeoff again. These steps are preceded by different parties and need to be done in a particular time frame. The logistics is a challenge. In every department, resources such as people and vehicles are limited, and requirements like service level agreements, government regulations, and many others have to be taken into account. Unforeseen circumstances can easily cause flight delays. Dispatchers need to change plans quickly, as a disruption in one process may cause further delays, resulting in a knock-on effect. If staff is not available or machines are broken, penalties might be unavoidable. Just imagine your processes are handled and optimized by using software. GroundStar is your solution. GroundStar delivers value to airlines, ground handlers, and all other stakeholders in the turnaround process. Its end-to-end -end approach supports you in your strategical and tactical planning, and in particular, at the day of operations. GroundStar is aware of all your resources, their locations, and assigned jobs, taking into account not only the travel time, but also the duration of each task. A powerful real-time optimization enables GroundStar to change plans automatically and provide an optimized schedule to efficiently allocate the available resources to the jobs. Let's have a closer look. Greg Groundster is responsible for the baggage handling. In the past, he used Excel sheets, paper, and radio to plan and execute his job. Once in a while, vehicles break down. In an ideal case, other trucks and drivers would be available to take over. If this was not the case, Greg had to check the location and availability of his other resources by radio. Additionally, the amount of baggage, all available trucks, and their travel time must be comprised. Under time pressure, a tricky task. Since GroundStar has been implemented, Greg is able to react to any changes in the plan within seconds. GroundStar considers special requirements and factors them into the strategic planning. On the day of operation, Greg can review all tasks and their pertinent information and assign them to his employees. As disruptions evolve, work processes can be adjusted in real time. And a fully mobile workflow ensures a smooth information flow between all parties. Be a ground star and rely on more than 25 years of worldwide experience. More than 70 organizations at 160 airports already put their trust in our aviation experts. As a ground star, you will reduce costs by up to 30%. You will achieve higher employee satisfaction by up to 95%. And you will boost your efficiency through our powerful optimizer. Find further information at groundstar.aero. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever, which part of the countries you guys are. Welcome to this webinar for the effective support of the grounded fleet. Um, uh, my name is Rahul Shah. I'm the vice, Senior Vice President of AAR Corporation for Strategy and Business Development for Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa. The industry is going through a turmoil much to the disappointment of nearly everyone in the industry. The COVID-19 pandemic is placing many aircraft on the ground, with two-thirds of the fleet parked for more an indefinite period. Many airlines in the industry, this is not a hyperbolic question. An entire world of isolation, travel ban, and cancel flights have created an exceeding significant overpopulation of grounded fleet. And many airlines need to take steps to that those aircrafts are secured. In the, in the case of aircraft on the ground, times exceeding from weeks to months to end year. Large lockdowns, the entire industry is facing racing to park aircraft. 2020 capacity is likely to be 
down staggering 70 to 80 percent between June, July and down. The, what will happen going forward in 2020 and 2021, it's, it's predicting that COVID-19 will still extend to 18 months. Current airline forecast also impacts the capacity on 2020 will be around 40 to 50 percent down than prior 2019 COVID-19. Now, the, the greatest of which is high degree of uncertainty as to exactly when things will improve. That's why it's vital to develop various scenario of how badly our business of airline and MRO keep posting to unfold situation. Currently, it's not even possible to predict whether a large majority of the global fleet will begin to enter into the service again. As you have seen and read, 33 to 4,000 to 5,000 aircrafts are parked, which probably will not come back to flight. So there is, so, and, and now some countries are still imposing strict travel restriction rather than easing that. It stands to reason that aircraft will continue to be grounded many for an indefinite amount of time. The grounding and re-entry into the service of the aircraft is common practice, but never to this magnitude and scale to gain further elimination to entire process, its impact on the aircraft utilization, as well as the keep flight on the go. This topic is very important to speak about. What does that mean for operators and MRO where there is a surge of re-entries? There are standard processes for parking and storing aircraft for longer period, which are stated in the aircraft maintenance manual. These manuals are tailored to the aircraft types and are approved by local authorities as per the approved maintenance program. It is the responsibility of the operator or whoever is the responsible for the aircraft airworthiness to ensure that storage states in the manual are carried out. Tasks need to be verified and completed as part of the regulation. They have to be maintaining the task to error the news of their. So now, with that situation and that background happening, I'm requesting our panel member to introduce themselves and then briefly, and then we can go on to have a questions answer session. Terry, can you go ahead, please? Sure. Thanks a lot uh, for the introduction, Raoul. So I am Teddy Canadas. Uh, I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of uh, Testia, which is a 100% Airbus company. I've been an Airbus guy for about 10 years, working a lot uh, as a sales interface for MROs, for airlines, uh, and a lot, uh, of course, on the maintenance field. And today I'm really happy to contribute to this panel uh, with all of you uh, guys and be able to voice uh, a little bit the NDT world. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chi? Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Chi Ho. I have been with Firefly Airlines for about eight years now. I started with an engineer and my current role in Firefly Airlines is the head of maintenance support. And I am also involved in MRO business development activities, so Firefly MRO. Great, thank you. Mr. Dillis. Yeah, so my name is Ilvina Slapinskas. For the last seven years, I am the CEO of Fell Technics, the independent MRO. And we have uh, hangars in Vilnius, Kaunas, it's in Lithuania. We have a hangar in Indonesia, in Jakarta. We opened the hangar in, in Harbin, in China. And we have a hangar with our daughter company, Storm Aviation, which is in Stansted, uh, near, near London. And we have almost 50 line maintenance stations all around the world. So now we are really, how to say, involved, deeply involved in the aircraft, aircraft parking. And I have a lot of to say today for the for this panel. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks. Thanks for the great brief introduction. Uh, generally, for the generally the way we do it is to have a question, have the panelists agree to it, then we ask for the audience participation. But in this case, we're not going to, we're going to wait to the end 
to have the audience participation in the event that we have time left for the discussion. So let's start with the first question for the panelists. How, so when you talk about maintaining ground support equipment and to make it readiness of the aircraft, how cost effective it is to bring in schedule, uh, how could the inspection domain contribute to support grounded fleet and cost effective return to the flight and readiness? Terry? Yes, uh, happy to contribute on this one. So, like I was saying, that, uh, I'm just uh, answering on behalf of Testia, which is an uh, expert in uh, integrity of the aircraft structure. Uh, so, what I can see from uh, my window is that for the grounded fleets, uh, there is a lot of AMM tasks uh, linked to fluid testing. So, uh, of course, uh, this is something that uh, Airbus Ines is uh, asking. Uh, in order to maintain the uh, the flyability of the aircraft, so there is regular fluid testing to uh, to do. Uh, our advice as well and recommendation is to do a lot of uh, visual inspections and also to anticipate the return to service, uh, because we see aircraft grounded for uh, in, uh, an unprecedented time. We never had aircraft grounded for so long, uh, and so uh, happens a lot of environmental factors like health, for instance, or strikes, uh, and then the the return to service, the return to fly can be jeopardized for, because of this long uh, parking, uh, parking duration. And uh, what we see happening is aircraft returning to service, but just before takeoff, we, we do the work around the aircraft and we realize there are big impacts. We realize there is maybe even corrosion. Uh, so this is where I think inspection domain has to jump in uh, before the return to flight to do vision inspection, to do non-destructive testing inspections, uh, to make sure that the aircraft is flyable. And in this situation, we want to avoid absolutely AOGs for airlines. So uh, I think this is tremendous for, for the airlines, extremely important uh, to have all of these uh, pre-flight pre uh, checks, let's say, but maybe deeper than what we usually do. Uh, maybe anticipate a night stop uh, before the return to flight uh, and uh, make sure we, uh, we avoid uh, inconvenient AOGs. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chi? Yes, thank you. So as a regional airline, I would say Firefly Airlines is still very lucky because we are still servicing local destinations within Malaysia during this period. So our aircraft are still flying, but at a very low utilize, uh, utilization rate. So therefore, proper planning from our network and scheduling team is very, very crucial because they will actually schedule to fly the aircraft within the immobilized, not store inspection stage, so that all our aircraft do not fall into the short-term parking stage. So all our fleet currently are still active, except for two aircraft, which are currently on hangar checks. So I would say the most cost-effective way in our context is to keep our aircraft current, active, and to minimize maintenance costs on short-term and long-term parking requirement. And nevertheless, we don't compromise on the inspections or necessary maintenance tasks on the immobilized not store on our aircraft. Okay, is there a is there a window for an operator to make sure the aircraft grounding uh, minimize the cost so that they don't have to do all the routine maintenance to save the cost by the by the OEMs? Yeah, for ATR aircraft, we have this 28 days window. So within this 28 days, we can, yeah, we can actually apply the immobilization, not store procedures and inspections to keep the aircraft active. After 28 days, then it will fall into the short-term parking uh, inspection domain. Okay. As I understand, Gary uh, and Jels, uh, for the narrow bodies, I think uh, OEM and the R has allowed the maintenance menu is allowed 14 days in this in this situation that you need to be uh, servicing within the 14 days in order to avoid some of the maintenance of the ground so grounding of the aircraft. Is that uh, is that right, Celis? Yes, please. Yeah, I can, I can take that question. So, you know, 
starting from the beginning, uh, the most important thing uh, to to offer the the most cost effective um, ground grounding for the aircraft is uh, is uh, to get information from the from the customer or the owner of the aircraft what what uh, they are going to do with that aircraft. And I understand that in this situation, uh, in certain situations, it's not so easy to answer because you know. There are different procedures. Uh, it can be parking or can be storage. You know, parking is for three months, storage is for 12 months. And you know how to say it's a different cost and different different uh, approach of the of the of the, of the maintenance. And when we're asking the question, what you're going to do with the aircraft, you know, we, sometimes we we cannot get the answer, and then we offer that okay, let's do the parking or maybe let's do that storage if you think that you will not get the. Uh, if we speak to the leasing company that you will not get the uh, next customer for the 12 months, then we'll put it into the uh, storage, you know. But we had a situation that we put in storage and after one and a half months, the client came and said, guys, you know, I've got the customer, so I need to, to that that aircraft to, go, to come back to the operations, you know. So these, these uh, uh, decisions are not the most cost effective, but you know what we can do being independent tomorrow, we just follow the customer because he's dealing with that with that aircraft, and we are trying to find the the, the most uh, effect cost cost effective uh, solution. What is important to mention that when the operators or or or, or leasing companies uh, making a decision where to park the aircraft, uh, it is important to mention that it is. Uh, it is good to to have the MRO, which has the uh, the full scale of of capabilities. I mean, if we speak, for example, about Kaunas Airport and our hangar, which which is in Kaunas Airport, so first of all, the price of that of, of of the parking. You know, if you compare the price in Kaunas and somewhere in UK, the price can be different. I don't know, three five times is one thing. The other thing that you know, you can get all the solutions which you need for that aircraft. You need the line maintenance, okay. You need cargo service, okay. We can do this. If you make a decision, part out that aircraft. We can do the part out and help to sell the components. You need a cabin reconfiguration, no problem. We can do this. Uh, if you need a painting, you know, our partners, Mass Aviation, they're building the painting facility, and at the end of this year, we will help we have a painting facility next door of our hangar. So, you know, uh, some, so when we speak to the potential customers about the parking, they say, you know, the guys, your climate, your climate is not so good. Maybe we should go to Spain and, and, and so on. Uh, I agree. The climate maybe is not 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 so good as it is in Spain, you know, when the sun is shining all the time. But but you know, when you make a decision what you're going to do with that aircraft, then you have to move that aircraft to the MRO, which we can which can do all the all the uh, maintenance and, and and checks and everything, for, because you already have a decision you're going to do. So it is important to make the right decision in the beginning. Then you will get the most effective solution. Excellent, excellent. Well, that leads to our second question, which is, so the, the second question is framed under two scenarios. Um, I have, I've been talking to a lot of airlines, and some airlines are wanting, especially in Asia and Middle East, uh, they wanted to bring in maintenance when the aircrafts are grounded, so when the aircrafts are back to service, they don't need to spend time to grounding again for maintenance. So the question is, how cost effective it is to bring in scheduled maintenance earlier during the grounding so that once the market is open, ready, your airplanes are not stuck for maintenance? Eddie? Yeah, from, from my window, of course, uh, it seems uh, like a, a positive bet uh, whenever we see the aircraft starting to return to fly. Uh, it's linked to the previous comment. Uh, we have to ensure the, the serviceability of the aircraft at, uh, at by all means. Uh, this is for the survival, I guess, of, uh, of the airlines. So, yeah, if they can uh, do some uh, necessary maintenance to avoid some block times, uh, that, uh, that will 
would be key, I think, for the success and for uh, saving more aircraft availability. Uh, just a few examples that come to my mind. Uh, we've seen recently uh, uh, MROs triggered by operators asking us to come in, to jump in really quickly uh, to do some uh, some maintenance and let's say some inspections, right. which is what we do, uh, and to make it faster as well. Uh, we're working, for instance, with FL Techniques, which is what uh, one of our right. customers with Zilvinas, uh, which so we see some MROs which invested smartly in uh, automation and in making inspection faster because the airlines will ask you, OK, I'm, I'm going to return to service very soon. Uh, so we need to do sort of a slight check or an A check, uh, and then if you discover corrosion, if you discover dents, you need to have an okay. MRO which is equipped with uh, good technologies to bring this maintenance earlier so that you don't delay the, uh, the uh, service time. So I would say investing a little bit in uh, earlier maintenance and a little bit in technologies, in inspection technologies uh, for automatic dent mapping, uh, things like this. Yeah. Okay, so it could be minor or major. Um, of the maintenance what the airline can. I will talk about the airline which I spoken to is doing major operation on the maintenance, but let's go to Zach. I know you talked about it in a bit, so probably you can continue with uh, what you want to discuss on your experience with your customer. Uh, you, you yes. Me. yes, yes. So, yes. Uh, you know, before the uh, coronavirus, uh, we, when we were talking with the customers um, who are going to do the base maintenance, so the, the, we had two main questions. Uh, the first question was TAT, and the second question is the price. You know, because uh, the, the clients they're saying that you know the aircraft is making one money when it's flying, and it's it's, it's clear. Right. And they want uh, they wanted to get the aircraft uh, back as soon as possible from the maintenance to fly and to make money. Now we have a bit different uh, situation. Uh, the aircraft is, is is grounded. They're not flying. And now the TAT is not so important. The most important thing is the cost. It's, it's a, it means the price. So we say, guys, now it's really a good time to do the maintenance because we put the aircraft into the hangar and before the corona we were replacing the components uh, installing new one uh, or or you know uh, paying the exchange fees and so on now we can do this way that we remove the component send that component to the specialized shop they do the repair the component is coming back and we put back that same component you know because you know the tat is not so important the the feature which we which we were doing, I don't know, in 12 or 14 days. Now we can do for two months because the client saying, guys, I don't need that aircraft at, at today. Right. But I don't know when I will need it. So you have a time, one and a half months to do the C check. Please do it as cheap as you can, you know. So right. I think now it's a good time, especially having in mind the seasonality, which we have in Europe, you know, when in winter uh, it was impossible to get a slot for the base done, maintenance yeah. and in, in, in summer empty hangars, you know. So now summer is, 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 is it came already. Uh, so you can get a really attractive man hour price and you can save your money on the components replacement and so on. So now it's really a good time for to do the maintenance earlier using this opportunity. This is our position. Correct. Mr. Chi, as an airline perspective, what do you think? Yes, in the context of Firefly Airlines, since we have the in-house MRO capabilities to carry out our base maintenance checks up to C-checks, HMV, so it is actually a very good opportunity for us to schedule our base maintenance for all the grounded aircraft. So if uh, the aircraft have less than 30% of the remaining hours or cycles, so we consider to schedule earlier for the base maintenance check. Yeah. And because our all our maintenance crew are still at work and they are not on unpaid leave, so it's right. a good opportunity to fully utilize our team, our resources to yeah, to, to do the schedule okay. maintenance. Also, we practice uh, full utilization of our resources to carry out preventive maintenance as well. Okay. Yeah. 
on top of that, we also having collaboration with Part 147 training organization so that they could actually send their students or trainees to our organization to do the on-job training on the ground on the grounded yes. aircraft. So the aircraft are actually the live training material for them. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Now, the, there are two three scenarios what airlines play, like Ms. T mentioned. If you don't have the maintenance organization within your own airline, there are two school of thoughts. One is whether I want to maintain my aircraft now or later and then conserve cash because right now cash is the king. Okay, so that's one aspect. Yes. And the second aspect, if because if I'm sending my aircraft out to the third party MRO, I'm dashing cash out and that's where I want to conserve my cash, so I want to delay it. But let's say if you have a, like Mr. Chi mentioned, if you have a maintenance organization within your airline, you want to get everything done like Mr. Chi mentioned, utilize your manpower, utilize your back, you know, downtime, and make sure that it's all cost effective to, you know, get the maintenance done. For example, I was talking to Etihad Airlines uh, CEO, engineering CEO, and mm -hmm. he is his ba his bases are fully occupied because Etihad Airline made a decision that they want to bring in all the maintenance. Pre, uh, pre, you know, three, three to six months to make sure that they can take care of the ground time. And that, that's what I was just hinting towards this question, whether to utilize the resources you available, whether to cash holding is the priority. So I guess both ways it works depending upon your priorities. And that's how it works. Like US airlines are differing maintenance right now. Most of the airlines who sends aircraft out wants to phase out their maintenance for six to eight months because they're not flying now and they want to conserve the cash. And the Middle East airlines are insourcing. So there is a contrasting aspects of each of the, you know, uh, thought process there. Great. Well, that leads to our third question, uh, which is, so as Mr. Chi mentioned, the, when the aircrafts are grounded, how or how our downturn, downtime, how do you effectively utilize your asset, right? Because aircrafts is a high cost assets. And if you want, if you can utilize it, how could you do it in order to at least get some revenues or not all, right? When you have 10 to 15% of asset flying versus 90, 80 to 90% sitting, you got to figure out how to maximize that. So, so, the, the question is, the effective utilization of the aircraft is very important. What are the methods utilized by airline recently to boost revenue? Uh, anyone? Okay, this is right. So, you know, uh, situation very simple because our um, uh, design organization, which we have in NFL Techniques, they're selling these uh, modifications with cargo nets or car cargo bags. So we All had right. a lot of conversations with the with the customers and potential customers. And, you know, uh, they were saying that this is the only way to get some revenues and to utilize the aircraft and to, to, to pay to the leasing companies and to pay salaries and, and so on and so forth. So it was uh, it was the only way to, 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 to get some revenues to, to start right. flying like a cargo aircraft using these cargo nets, cargo bags. And uh, how to say, we've got a lot of requests uh, for, this, for, for these modifications. We sold a lot and, you know, in in our group in our holding company in other solution group because uh, fl technics belongs to other solution group we have uh, cmi operators like uh, smart links like avion express so you know they made really good numbers of flights flying cargo from uh, from Vilnius to China from China to somewhere to Europe bringing masks and all this all this uh, stuff you know for the for the coronavirus you know and and, and so on so yeah how to say and uh, different different uh, options of the uh, different modifications just cargo nets 
just cargo bags, so remove every second row of the seat, remove all the seats, you know, but it's, then it's SDC, it costs more. So different decisions, but, but you know, on that time, if we speak, I don't know, one month ago, was the huge demand for the cargo flights, you know, and, and, and the guys were making, how do you say, quite a normal money, you no, know, yes. having in mind the right. situation, you know, in, in, the, in the aviation industry. So, right. we, okay. we made also the revenue on this, so we are very happy about that. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, I would like to take it. Okay. okay. Yes. As you may are aware, e-commerce businesses in Malaysia is really booming at the moment. So we have actually some contacts on uh, chartering our flights and freight. Yeah, so that is one stream of the revenues. And I would say um, from the ATR operator's perspective, if we were to convert our aircraft into cargo config, it's not really cost effective in our opinion because the investment is huge. So we are more like uh, choosing the option of a combination of carrying both passengers and cargo and especially relying on the charter flight as freight on the aircraft. Okay. Yeah. So you're, you're saying your cargo is going in the belly, you're not putting in the in, 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 on the seat or removing the seat or yeah. putting nets like you yeah, mentioned. No. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ted, you want to add anything, Teddy? Well, uh, I think uh, the main point was said uh, about assets. What we've seen as well uh, as many airlines uh, are uh, renting, uh, leasing their aircraft. Uh, we see uh, we are participating in inspections for some uh, return to lease, uh, and I think some airlines take the opportunity and the strategy to keep the most efficient assets, also in terms of airplanes. Uh, to make sure that uh, they fly with the, uh, the less uh, the, the airplanes with uh, the better or full consumption, for instance, the best air. Okay. okay. No, that's great. That's great. That's I think, like you, like as I yeah. mentioned, there are two, three options to change airplane passenger to cargo, and some of the regulators uh, are also pretty cooperative on not some of the things you can put on seats and nets, you don't need to change the STC so that removes the cost and everything else. So I think that's a both ways. But one more question on this, going forward, do you think the demand as the passenger traffic grows, do you think the combination of passenger and cargo will continue or they will continue with the passenger and cargo on the belly? Mr. Jads? I think that it will come back to 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 cargo to is in the be, in the belly. Okay. Because you know the uh, how to say we have uh, two kinds of the of the of the airlines, you know, cargo and then passenger. So the 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 aircraft which is cargo aircraft it's it always will be more effective carrying cargo than than the passenger aircraft passenger. carrying cargo. You know, it's it's just just uh, because of the situation you know with with right. this coronavirus you know uh, because when 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 the industry will come back to the normal level uh, then i think the cargo will be carried with cargo planes or in the belly of the of the passenger uh, aircraft okay i i was i was talking to one of the senior vp engineering maintenance of an airline and his comments was that although the passenger traffic will come up but it's not at the scale what they're anticipating for next two years. They may do the combination of passenger and cargo on the seat as well to just boost the revenue because they don't think they're going to sell 100% of the seats and all those things. So I'm, I'm just telling you what uh, I've been told and our experiences and everything else. Great. So that leads to our next question. Um, it talks about the technology and investments and how to boost during the grounding, right? Um, how to do more with less uh, skills, investments, whatever. And 
uh, and uh, so I want I want to have your share experience to the audience on what do you think about those uh, areas where airlines or MRO would be investing or not investing, Mr. Chi. Okay, so I think this is a uh, direction moving towards online kind of thing. So as we are meeting online today, even in different countries, so it's evident that online setting is necessary for some of our uh, engineering crew continuous training. And also it's easier to share our resources with other organization. Like we, right. we could have a trainer from other airlines to train our crew. So um, I would say it's definitely possible to make most of our training online. Online. especially okay. those uh, soft skills and classroom training. Mm -hmm. However, as a maintenance personnel, I would still prefer the classroom. physical training, especially on uh, on job trainings, Correct. physical trainings, yeah, are still necessary for our engineering crew and yeah. the trainees. Yeah, okay. only okay. those soft skills and maybe classroom training may be replaceable by online training. Online training, great, good. How about uh, Teddy? Yeah, on this, uh, I see two, two strategies uh, emerging. There is the, the insourcing and the outsourcing in terms of skills. And uh, I see some airlines are choosing which skills to insource, which skills to outsource. Uh, talking about what I know, talking about uh, aircraft structure integrity, uh, about uh, NDT. Uh, I see that there is some opportunities to outsource some expensive inspections, some in inspections. Uh, some expensive uh, uh, skills that, uh, that are maybe hard to find. Uh, and on the contrary, some uh, more easy uh, inspections which are triggered by automation, which are uh, right. doable with technologies. Uh, we see some opportunistic airlines which are investing, saying we're going to invest in automation, we're going to invest in doing more with less. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking about one, uh, one tool for CLAD inspection that we have, the CLAD tool. We have uh, qu uh, quite a good amount of requests to do CLAD inspection with a B1 technician uh, through, uh, through the type of tools that we have, where you don't have to use very expensive skills or, or, very, or very skilled profile because the tool right. is taking it off. So that's the sort of uh, paradigm that uh, I see uh, emerging, trying to do uh, more with less, trying to do more with technologies which are uh, taking uh, the difficult uh, part of certification inside of the tool. Okay. So yes. And you know, how to say, because of the coronavirus, uh, the, how to say, the position from the regulator side changed and became uh, more soft. I mean that, you know, we've got the approval from YASA to do like a virtual training in the classroom and we had a situation that you know we had to do the training for our line maintenance guys and before that we had a, how to say procedure that they are coming to Vilnius sit in one classroom for two weeks they they listen to the to that uh, theory and then we have practical training or job training and so on so now we did it, uh, you know, in, in virtual training. I to say we were using Zoom uh, application to do the virtual training. And, you know, we saved a lot of money. I mean, the guys were sitting at, at home and listening to the, to the instructor. And, of course, uh, uh, speaking about the exams, they have to come. They have to come, to, and then we have uh, to do the exams live, you know. But but uh, but then they have to come for two days, but not to spend two weeks, you know, living in a right. hotel. And so on. So, okay. so I think that uh, now uh, regulators, uh, industry, and, and and people, they they see that now we have a uh, how to say different uh, different approach, and then habits are changing. Before that, you have such a uh, conference, you have a panel discussion, it was a bit strange, you know, and now it's, it's, it's normal because, because you have these uh, online meetings every day, you know, you spend uh, the whole day near the computer because your colleagues, your partners, your clients are sitting at home and so on, and it, it become normal. So I think that we will be using some kind of these kind of things more and more. Okay. But, but uh, 
speaking about the, 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 the exams and practical training, of course, we, 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 we will keep in the, this old fashioned way, you know, because right. I, I don't have an, an idea how we can change it. Uh, so, you know, because you have to come to the aircraft and do the maintenance, not, not on the right. computer or something, but to yeah, do okay. the, the, real, the real job. So this is yeah. the, the, the situation. As if okay, I may have, uh, please. Go ahead. Yeah, if I may add something just to bounce on uh, what Zivinas just said, uh, we see also uh, quite a big request for uh, remote assistance with virtual software like this one. When you have uh, uh, an AOG technical problem on an aircraft, on a grounded aircraft, and you don't have the expert, uh, then to have a remote expert. Uh, doing a, a remote diagnosis, a remote okay. inspection. So, for instance, yeah, we have a software for this, and yes, we sir. see uh, quite a lot of demand for this. Yeah. Is that is that a help monitoring big data, or this is specific no. to a component? This one is different. It's just a, it's a software. It's a secured software where uh, if you have a B1 engineer or technician which is stuck on an airplane, you can connect him uh, and connect his device to an expert which is in the office or which is on the other side of the planet, uh, okay. and he can see his screen. He can take over control. Uh, if he's doing an inspection, he can change ultrasonic parameters, whatever. So yeah, that's a way to assist uh, with an expert. Yeah. We were doing some some inspection on inlet calls. I remember using just you know video showing to the to the to the shop that what we have a situation and what they think what we should do, you know, and it was really good. So I believe in the future we will be using more and more, you know, this, Correct. this Correct. online online communication. Yeah. yeah, you know, one of the question I had in my mind that. You know, there, there was a. I spoke at the conference uh, last year about big data and how that impacts the, you know, uh, maintenance and predictive maintenance and everything else. One question in my mind, and you want to comment, or if you can comment, that's great. Is what happens when the aircraft's on the ground? What happened to the health, moni health monitoring system with the new aircraft, which OEMs are inputting with engine and airframe? How is that going to impact, uh, you know, so let's say when your grounding is done and when you fire up the engine, would those data for the health monitoring will go back to OEM or not for the starting? It has to be fired at those data. And anyone comment on that? One. From my past, uh, I, I knew quite well of a couple of uh, big data systems like the SEMS report or the QAR, the AR data. Uh, this is generally data which is generated in flight or uh, with engine uh, after power uh, power on. Uh, so most of the data, uh, from what I know, okay. is not generated uh, on the ground. And when you start again, this yeah. is uh, data that you can unrack from the airplane or collect through uh, SATCOM. So it's not really... Uh, Excellent. Excellent. Well, this is great. Uh, that leads to our next question, which is tricky, but I thought that would be good to discuss on what are the challenges airlines face on the hard time components or safety equipments due to low utilization during forced grounding of the planes? And what are the OEMs doing about this to make changes to the maintenance manual? Anyone? That, that's 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 a good uh, question. Uh, how okay. to say? We know we know that uh, how to say we've got some rumors. You know that some of the airlines are trying to to talk with OEMs and then to to to, how to, say, to, to 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 change it. But at the moment, you know how to say the calendar time comes and then you have to take to change these hard time components you know so we are, now we are doing like as as as, as, as in normal uh, way but uh, you know I, I i can tell one again once again that you know we heard that some big airlines really big airlines are, uh, are in talks with OEMs uh, somehow to change it, but but uh, we never uh, got any precise information that it will be changed or it's changed and so on. So now it's right. hard time components we change according to the calendar and that's it. Right. Anyone, uh, Mr. G, you have anything on adding value on this one? 
Uh, yeah, as an operator, we can't really save costs on this uh, hard time components and safety equipment, even due to the low utilization. However, we are actually considering more cannibalization activities in order to conserve the cash flow by delaying the procurement of uh, certain parts or components. And for those okay. components that are on the PBTH maintenance contract, yeah, actually, we are benefiting from it now because uh, due to the PPTH rate. And um, regarding the OEM, I would say that I'm actually very interested to know what are the OEM doing about this to make changes to the maintenance manual. So let's wait for their good news without compromising our safety standards. Correct, correct. So I think when you talk about the hard life component, the first thing that comes to my mind is the landing gear, because this is a high cost driver, high cost yes. for removing it and you know, you know, ground and making sure the landing gear removal is in line with your C or D check so that we don't have to ground the aircraft, right? So if, if you're grounding the airplane for let's say another one year, okay? you're losing practically 10 to 15 percent of your life without being utilized because it's a time control right 10 years or yes. 10,000 cycle whatever comes first so i think one of one of i was talking to boeing um last two weeks ago one of the engineers and we were talking about it and he said a lot of airlines has approached boeing especially on a max grounding because you know the grounding has already surpassed 12 to 14 to 16 months and what happens to those components, our hard time component, which has not been utilized, but it's clocking the time, you know? So that that's mm -hmm. where this question came to my mind. I thought this would be a good good thing to pose to the panelists and discuss about it. Same thing in safety equipment as well. You know, the time and all the other stuff which goes on, you don't have a choice but to replace it with the time, you know? Um, yes. on, safe, on the batteries and emergency lights and, and degradation of the batteries during, especially on the hot zone where Middle East is work operating. They have also issues because of, you know, so the OEMs, on that OEM has come back and they've given a storage um, a scenario where they can take it out and store it for a while. So at least it, it reduces degradation for the batteries and, uh, uh, you know, and in that one. So that saves cost for the airline. So I just wanted to throw it out because I have experienced this, that this is ongoing, and OEMs is looking at trying to see what they can do. I doubt they could do, but let's see what happens, right? Like Mr. Chi says. Um, so that comes to our last question, right? What will be the way forward for the airline after the pandemic ends or when they start flying? I mean, you hear about IATA, IATA and IKEO has given a directions about the safety standards at the airport, the personal protective equipments, the purification system, the you know protective shield and uh, UV lights and everything else. What do you think, in your mind, uh, as an airline, Mr. Chi, would 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 that impact your operation and cost? I would say we are still waiting for uh, the latest SOP from our government to see if uh, there are any necessary items or additional uh, requirement uh, required by our, uh, our government and the regulator. So uh -huh. we will then act accordingly to their SOP. So I okay. definitely think that definitely there will be uh, extra cost involved. Correct. And in our management's point of view, we are actually exploring opportunities to expand our MRO capabilities and invest heavily in terms of the infrastructure to enhance our MRO capabilities so that we can actually uh, generate revenue from MRO activities and just okay. not to heavily rely on the revenue from the airlines. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And how about European airline, Teddy? Um, with your experience, what, what's going to happen to when the traffic picks uh, up? Really, 
<laughs> very hard to say, and I'm not sure anyone uh, can really have a, a clear view on, on, on the future yeah. at the moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we see that uh, with the latest communications that uh, uh, airplanes are safe uh, in terms of air flow uh, going from the ceiling to the to the ground with a very strong renewal of air. Uh, of a couple of minutes, so I think we we're gonna be able to show that yes, this is uh, already implemented since years, and this is uh, uh, the safety standard which is high above what we need to prevent from any contamination. So I think this is uh, passing through this message. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, the airlines are putting a lot of efforts in uh, cleaning in disinfection between flights. So right. probably we'll see uh, more and more efforts there. But yeah, little by little, I hope uh, it will go back. Uh, it will go back. Yeah, yeah I, I saw I saw a picture of an ultraviolet uh, cart going through the aisle of the airline to clean the, with the UV lights to in, disinfect the airplane, which was pretty neat actually. When I saw it, I said, wow, this could be an, uh, probably a solution airline could do within the, within the you know, uh, change of flights or you know, whatever the network they're doing. Uh, but like she said, it's, it's obviously increased cost, right? Uh, keeping middle seat empty, obviously that's gonna be, you know, either it can be offsetted by an cost of the ticket or probably the airline doesn't have that cost factor or the load factor in order to do that. So I guess that this is going to be trade-offs where the airline needs to make it, but it's going to be depending on each government, like Mr. Chi said, how they're going to make rules for each of the countries and airports and airlines to see that customer feels, the traffic feels protected, safe, and flying again. I think that that would be that would be the way to go. Uh, so if, this, if I, we if have I may, if I may, please just to add, you know, to my personal opinion, the most important thing is do the testing before the the passenger coming to the plane. I mean, you go know, ahead. we can we can find out all these protective shields, AV. And, and everything, but but the most important thing not to let the the person who is ill to, into the airport maybe or or at least to the plane. If Correct. if uh, everybody, I mean the passengers, will have the information that everybody who is in, in the plane are tested, and with the, the how to say the test is negative, then they feel safe and everything will be okay, and then they will people will start flying again. So we should test uh, all the passengers, I don't know, before entering the plane or maybe before entering the airport. You know, just just, just uh, everybody who is in the airport, it means that they are going to fly, they are tested and then everybody feels safe. I think it's the, 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 the easier solution to my understanding because to keep the empty seat, it's not, also not 100% uh, guarantee. Because we can go yeah, to, yes. to, to lavatory and you yes. know just touch some surfaces, and the next the next passenger will come touch the same service uh, surface, and then we will have the situation. So, I think that testing testing before entering the plane is the the the, the best solution, to my understanding. Uh, I I completely agree. I think uh, testing at the airport and have a mask uh, for the passengers for a while just to make sure that nobody get uh, you know infected so yeah no that's great well that leads to 10 more minutes of our session so we are open for the questions from the audience please uh, ask us a question to the panelist or to the moderator if you have it hello yeah please uh uh, hi, I'm Shvila from Aerotime News. I would like to ask uh, the panelists to speculate a bit about the future and looking forward to aviation recovery, the return of flights and um, basically business as normal mode. Uh, do you see any possible bottlenecks in your industry that could delay or prolong the process? And uh, well, just to explain where I'm coming from with this question is uh, the Boeing 737 MAX grounding. Um, back in January, uh, there were expectations uh, that 
and grounding of the plane might be complicated uh, because of the lack of flight simulators in the markets. Uh, do you see any possible parallels in your field? Okay, so yeah, there are I, two I, questions I, there. So yes, please, Jals, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, uh, how to say, it can happen that, uh, for example, uh, the coronavirus will be, how to say, defeated and uh, passengers uh, will come back to the airports and to the, to the planes and everybody wants to fly again as was before and they feel safe. Then it can be that, you know, how to say, the, the aircraft uh, which are parked now, uh, it will take some time for the MROs to, to return to service this, 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 this aircraft because, you know, to do the uh, C checks, D checks, uh, you know, engine changes, so all the all the all the work you you have to do before before uh, the aircraft can be released to, to service so it can it can be some kind of a queue you know but uh, you know i think it's it's the it's the best scenario which we can imagine that we will have a queue of the aircraft uh, coming back to the to the service so i hope that it will happen okay Okay, anyone else? Okay, I would if say not, in the context of uh, Firefly Airlines, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say it's a bottleneck, but it's a challenge for our business is that we are trying to um, target more leisure travelers because Firefly Airlines, most of our passengers are business travelers. And I would say the next recovery the forecasted one will be the leisure travel comes first before the business travelers. So we are, our marketing team is actually working hard to target more of the leisure travelers should be on board on our, on our aircraft to actually generate the revenue from all these leisure travels. Okay. And that, Mr. Chi, that's predominantly domestic travel, correct? No international Yes. Yet. Yes. Okay. Yeah, local destinations. Right. I, I can give you some synopsis of what's going on. Um, so if you look at China, China was the first to get the COVID-19. And if you look at last two months, China has expanded the domestic uh, network. Almost 60 to 70 percent of the aircrafts are flying. So that's a good clue. OK, again, I, uh, whether every country will follow or full of this foot feet or follow the pattern, we, we, it needs to be seen, but at least there is an encouraging news from Chinese airlines, at least for domestic uh, aircraft uh, flights, that they have started flying and that infection rate has gone down or almost nothing. So that's one clue. And the second, obviously, the bottleneck could be that if, if the COVID-19 resurfaces because of opening of the borders or opening of the regions that could impact the downstream you know uh, of the traffic so that's that's a two scenario but but i don't th i don't think anybody has a crystal ball to figure it out how that's yes. going to be impacted i mean all the statistics from each of the consulting companies and aita and everybody else says the pre covid 219 traffic will only be restored after three years and after 21 period. I still believe that that would be lesser than that. Again, I'm just going by what happened in China and now New Zealand is starting, Australia is starting, and hopefully Europe and um, US will be starting domestic. International flights are gonna be taking time. That's my take. Yes, yes. Good. Any more questions from audience? Hello again. I would also like to follow up a bit on my previous question in the more pessimistic scenario. And um, speaking about a possible um, second wave of COVID-19, um, based on your experience in the past few months, uh, do you have any advice or takeaways uh, how to prepare for the possible second wave? Thank you. 
Thank you for the question. Panelist, anyone wants to take this? Okay. I can take it. So, you know, I think that the, the airlines and the Maros, I mean, all the participants of the aviation industry uh, who survived this, uh, they made all the steps uh, to survive. I mean, to cut all the all the costs to keep the company as much effective as, as you can. And how do you say when you when we come back to the normal life, uh, hopefully in the nearest future, I think that for some time you will be feeling that you know something bad will can happen tomorrow and you will not be so you will not feel so safe as it was you know i don't know half a year ago so think that i think that you know we have to to, to understand that this uh, industry which is really uh, fascinating and and very interesting and challenging and it was so fast growing you know because people like to travel and and, and the, the business is, is, is becoming more global and, and, and global so you know it is so effective easily when we have such a such a situation with the with the, with the virus so i think that everybody who is in this industry will be thinking about not only having a good days but but thinking about uh, what's going to happen when you have a bad day and to be, right. to be ready for this so you know the 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 the, the thing you have to have in your mind uh, if you lead the, the airline the maro that you know you should you should not over invest and to be over optimistic about the future because you know how now we have a situation that that you know it, it changed dramatically i don't know in, in two, three weeks you know i never dreamed such a situation in 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 in, in, in the in the in the worst uh, dream you know so all right. you all have right. to think that that you have to be ready that for, for all the possible scenarios for the growth and for the very fast decline yeah if I may uh, compliment, uh, I, I'm totally with Elvinas. I think, uh, yeah, the airlines to prepare and the MRO, they'll have to be extremely focused on cash, on the cost, uh, to make sure uh, we, we are safe for the next wave or next uh, problem. I think Silvinas mentioned as well efficiency. Uh, probably the most efficient ones will be the ones uh, the most resilient. And efficiency also goes through the smartest uh, investments and uh, the fastest investments. So I think, yeah, it would be difficult to envision long term investments, but there were many uh, solutions, many technology which bring short term savings. Uh, and I think. Airlines and MROs will have to accelerate the investment in very short-term savings with low cash exposure, with maybe financial possibilities, etc. But bringing efficiency uh, quickly uh, before uh, before uh, any other problems. Yeah. Great. To so add on a little on what Ted has shared, yeah, I think uh, among the industrial players, it's inevitable for all of us to share some of our resources to be more efficient and to also to have more collaboration among the organizations to achieve the common goals. Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. I think uh, I agree with all three of you. Uh, it's going to be fit survival of fittest, right? And you need to make sure that you have enough uh, resources, the cash and able to withstand this downturn in order to make sure that you come come back strong. Um, um, yeah, uh, I think that that comes to our end of the session. Just to wrap up, uh, again, uh, you know, this is a, a great situation where aircrafts are grounded and we need to make sure that those grounded aircrafts goes back into the air with the traffic as much as soon as possible so that all the airlines and all the MROs can start you know, getting revenues and at least then bring back the employments, which is going to be the key issue right now. With that, I thank each of the panelists for that contribution. I think it was great to have your thought process and very good answers to the questions.
Audience, uh, you are great in listening. Thank you for the questions. And this is Rahul Shah, your moderator, taking off from that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Luis Alvarez, and I am a solution expert in the field of aircraft maintenance for the company Inform Software, based in Aachen, Germany. And I'm very happy to be part of this online conference and share with you um, the knowledge I've gathered on the subject over the past years. So today we're going to talk about increasing your line maintenance productivity, and I'm talking about staff productivity, and decreasing your technical delays. And we're also gonna look at how you can do this in the area era of Corona virus. So we're gonna start off looking at the challenges in line maintenance, including during pandemic times. I'll then give you some advice and tips on how you can improve your line maintenance staff planning and control. And finally, we'll discuss uh, the benefits when you follow these type of uh, process improvements. Now, one of the things that are unique to line maintenance planning and which make it challenging is that you have on the one side, a set of plan tasks that you know you have to do. You have a set of staff members which are available to you and you have unplanned maintenance which can happen at any time you can forecast values of how much unplanned maintenance you'll have but ultimately it doesn't always come as you expect and the challenge in line maintenance compared to other areas of ground operations is how to get those aspects or basically how can you get those uh, um, uh, uh, requirements in line together, right? The challenge is to assign planned and unplanned tasks efficiently to the available staff members to get everything done as you need it to be done. Now the challenges are that aircraft don't arrive on time, they bring unexpected defaults and planning engineers under such conditions is difficult. It's difficult to do manually. 
The coronavirus pandemic has brought additional challenges. Infection of staff will cause forced quarantine to other staff members, making it suddenly a challenge to have enough people to get the work done. You also have the challenge of parked aircraft, which uh, also need to be maintained because you want to have them ready to fly. Things are evolving so quickly right now that you can't just uh, have your aircraft parked and uh, without having them available to fly at short notice. And finally, the increased cost pressure due to the lack of revenue uh, means that you need to be very efficient with regards to um, costs, um, which implies you have to keep an eye on your productivity. Now, one thing which is important to note um, and the reason why we focus on staff is that in line maintenance, staff is the most expensive asset you have. So engineers and technicians, um, according to an IATA airline maintenance cost executive commentary from 2013, states that over 50% of your cost per flight hour in the area of line maintenance is assigned to staff, right? The rest going from material and outsourcing. So if you can make an impact on reducing uh, or increasing the productivity and efficiency of your staff, that's going to have the strongest impact on your bottom line. And that's why we're going to focus on staff planning. So how do you approach that? Now, from our experience working with customers, it's important that you look at line maintenance planning long term and in its complete dimensions, right? You have to have a strategic plan. You have to look at tactical planning, which is more um, two weeks out, four weeks out, eight weeks out, so midterm. Finally, you have to have a good operational planning. And ultimately, you need to use proper reporting and analysis to feed back into the cycle uh, and start again. Now, let us look at these processes just briefly. If you're interested in learning more about this, then we're always available for, for a discussion. Um, but briefly, strategic planning is about planning your long-term workload. So you have to identify how much work are you going to have in the next 6 to 12 months. Now, this can be based on the flight schedule that you're serving. If you're working for other customers, um, you can use their flight schedules. And then you have to see, okay, this is the type of work type of line maintenance work we do at this basis, and this is the type of line maintenance work with this other base. So you need to have a good idea on your long-term workload. Once you have a good idea of your workload, you can start generating shift plans. Um, some line maintenance uh, companies have pretty rigid shift plans. So the idea here is to check where could changes be done to better suit the workload demand. And because we're in a situation right now where the next six to 12 months are very dynamic, uh, it's important that you have an idea uh, that you start thinking about how your recovery is going to be and what the workload is going to be at the different stages. The next phase is a tactical planning. This is when you look at your workload that you've estimated, you look at the shifts, the optimal shifts which you've created for the workload, and you start assigning shifts to individual staff members. So this is where you put names to the shifts. And here it's also important to keep certain uh, requirements uh, under control. For example, your staff are going to have certain wishes like parental leave, um, maybe training. That's an important issue in line maintenance. So you have to keep this under control and, and, uh, and make sure that you can do a good plan which matches your staff requirements but also the business requirements. During the tactical planning, you're going to work on schedule readjustments. So, you know, as you get closer to day of ops, uh, you might have people asking for shift changes, shift swaps. Um, you might have people calling in or, or saying they have some expected uh, planned leave for whatever reason, and you have to do some short-term adjustments even after having published a schedule. So that's something you do in tactical planning. Finally, operational planning is about the day of ops assignments. So you're on the day of ops or one day out, you know pretty accurately who's going to be there because they've checked in in the morning. So you have your team, you have your aircraft flying in, flying out. You have a pretty good idea of what the situation is on the aircraft, what your mail items are, your defects. And that's when you start assigning real people, real tasks to the aircraft, right? And you have to monitor that and you have to react 
to the operations, the unplanned maintenance, which we discussed before, or the usual flight irregularities, delays, cancellations, diversions. Um, so it's very important to keep an eye on that. Finally, the overarching phase or, or process, which should accompany you throughout all of these phases is the historical data analysis to improve your future process. So this is a feedback loop which you have to keep an eye on. And at Inform, when we speak to our customers, this is something that we look at when we, we do scoping studies. We look at these uh, four phases. We try and see how are they doing each one of them, on which ones are they you know, doing it right, and on which ones can they, can they receive support. Inform has software for each of these phases. Um, on the slides right now, you can see the names of our modules. These are all part of the line maintenance solution that we offer uh, customers to improve the way they do their staff planning. I don't wanna get into too much details with the products because this is not a, a product demo, but just so you know that if you're interested, you can come and talk to us. Now, coronavirus is an important issue right now and it affects line maintenance just as much as it does other departments in the aviation business. And um, your aim is going to be, of course, to reduce the risk of infection spreading across your teams. If one member um, is sick and that member has a lot of contact with a lot of other staff members and then you have to quarantine them all, then in one go, you're going to lose a lot of valuable staff members. So you can avoid and, and mitigate that risk by reducing the amount of contact you plan in your schedule, right? And I have these slides here where you can see two charts. On the left, you see what happens if you have one large team. And with one team, the contact between the team members is high. So within two weeks, you're going to have most of the people having had contact with most of the other people. So the risk of all of them being quarantined if one of them uh, tests positive is very high. In the second chart, you can see what happens if you divide into four teams and those teams operate separately from each other. So in this case, after two weeks, the amount of contact between the team members is largely reduced. And therefore, in the case of an infection in one of these teams, you do not have to quarantine as many people. This is good to protect your staff and it's good to, be, to have a resilient line maintenance operation, which is very important because right now, you need every staff member you can get to make sure that you can have a successful recovery phase. So this is something that you can look at when planning your teams. And we have optimizers that can be calibrated to reduce the amount of contact between team members. So it actually is done automatically for you. The other thing which is very important, and this is important also for all aspects of, of aviation staff, is you have to be in a position to identify who has been in contact with who, because if you do have to enforce quarantine or if you have to inform staff members, you wanna find them quickly. The faster you can isolate the spread of the virus, the smaller the impact is gonna be for your business. We also have some tools here. One of them is our contact tracking web app, which basically can tell you what, basically what tasks a person was doing, when they were doing it, and most importantly, with who they were doing. It. So you can identify all the contacts that person has had in the past two weeks and you can react and identify potential uh, 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 infectious people. The other tool we have is a hardware-based solution. In this case, you use a Bluetooth chip which can be attached to your staff ID card and every time two people spend time together, that Bluetooth chip actually tracks that and, 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 and notes that down. So you then have a database which tells you who has been close to whom and for how long. So this is a hardware-based approach where you can quickly identify uh, staff contacts for the same purposes. It's important to know that these two solutions are corporate-based. So these are not private solutions. This is not for tracking people at home. This is purely in the corporate environment and should be uh, quick to implement. Finally, what we also have at Inform and which we're currently offering 
free of charge to our customers or to anybody who's interested is an employee portal. Now, most of you are in a situation where your staff have been made redundant or they might be on forced leave or working reduced hours. And it's the same in line maintenance. If you now want to start ramping up your operation and you need to bring them back into the job, the question is how can you communicate with everybody efficiently? We have a cloud-based solution which can run on mobile devices and which you can control and which helps you quickly communicate to your different staff members, to your teams, what their shifts are, when they should come into the office, um, and, and it lets them plan and it makes the whole communication much more streamlined, especially now that things are so dynamic. So in the line maintenance area, this is something that you can look to um, get your teams back into work. So what are the benefits of planning your line maintenance staff long-term and taking into account the challenges of the coronavirus? Well, what we've seen at installations we've done at our customers, and we have customers in the US, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia using our software, is that you can increase your workforce productivity by up to 35%, right? And that's a pretty large number. Um, you can achieve more basically by keeping your labor costs pretty much unchanged. So you can increase uh, the amount of work you wanna take with your current staff. Um, we've also seen that you can reduce the amount of defects you have, open defects uh, by up to 25%. And that's good for your fleet. It's good for the operation ability of your fleet. You wanna make sure that your aircraft can fly everywhere at all times. So the, least, the less uh, defects you have, the easier that's gonna be for your ops colleagues. By having a better productivity and a much uh, a simpler control of your staff, you're going to reduce the amount of technical delays. You want to avoid situations where bad planning or bad communication lead to an aircraft being delayed due to maintenance staff, right? And our software can help you reduce that. Finally, by moving to a mobile platform, you're going to reduce the amount of voice communication. So that makes it much more reliable and it allows you to track what people have said and when and then uh, uh, use this reporting and historical data to improve the way you work. Finally, with these benefits, we've seen our customers reduce their maintenance costs by their labor line maintenance costs by 12 to up to 30 percent. So that gives you a rough sum up of uh, what we're working on in the area of line maintenance and I'd be very happy to take any questions. So thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you in real life soon.
thank you very much uh, for the whole air convention team for having us here in that uh, conversation about how aircraft uh, modifications can support airlines during the challenging crisis. Uh, before we really start with our panel discussion, I'd like to introduce all the participants. Um, starting by myself, my name is Nicole Nork. I am working as the managing director for the Independent Aircraft Modifier Alliance uh, for now um, one year. And before I have an, uh, a history in aircraft modification base maintenance, mainly with Lufthansa Technik, uh, that is uh, all I have to say about myself. So when we go to the Independent Aircraft Modifier Alliance, you might ask yourself, who is that? Uh, we are a non-profit association based in Hamburg, uh, having meanwhile nine members uh, from the aviation industry, and we advocate for trustworthy STC. Uh, we have several goals, uh, and amongst others, uh, one of our goals uh, indeed is uh, to uh, create a recognized uh, standard throughout the whole value chain, often modification project. So uh, that is uh, why I'm so honored to host this session today. Uh, and uh, to really dig into the opportunities of retrofit modifications. Uh, I'd like to hand over to our first panelist here, Chris Marcou. Chris, uh, may I give it to you to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Nicole, and thanks for inviting me to this. Uh, I'm uh, Chris Marcou. I'm the head of operational cost management at, at IATA. I'm the focal point for uh, IATA's work on uh, airline technical operations, uh, matters related to MROs, aircraft re uh, leasing and also uh, we do a lot of uh, cost uh, benchmark benchmarking activities in uh, the areas of, uh, of tech ops of maintenance. Uh, we have some projects on that we call uh, digital aircraft operations and operational uh, data programs and uh, before that I worked for uh, for Delta tech ops in, in Atlanta and I was in a, in a university working as a, as a professor. And uh, Regarding my uh, about IATA, most of you are aware uh, we represent uh, a huge body of the uh, airlines around the world. 290 airlines are our members. 82% of uh, of the uh, worldwide uh, airline uh, industry. Our mission is to represent, lead, and serve the industry. And uh, you may have known of of IATA because of our safety uh, audits. You may have heard of IOSA. In order to be a member, you need to pass that audit. And uh, in addition, another more than 100 airlines are taking the IOSA audit on, on uh, when it's needed. We develop guidance materials, uh, training. Uh, we accredit travel agents, develop codes. We do data analysis and economic forecasts. And finally, uh, we are a clearing house that we settle uh, uh, between the airlines and other industry stakeholders, travel agents, uh, car rentals and, and so forth. And you can find more uh, about us in, in our uh, website. And with this, I will pass to our next panelist, please. Thank you, Chris. Uh, in, it's an honor to have you. And uh, let us uh, hand over to Jeff. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Good day to all. And thank you for inviting me to participate. My name is Jeff Ludicky, and I'm the Managing Director at Tronos Aviation Consulting. I've been working in this wonderful industry for 30 years now, and it continues to be exciting and present challenges for us all, to say the least. Uh, the majority of my experience centers around the cabin interior products and services related to, to cabin and passenger environment. Um, this includes product development, manufacturing, program management, uh, reconfiguration activities, and aircraft modifications. Uh, next slide, please. At TAC, um, we specialize in interior forecasting, strategy, interior reconfiguration development, and management of those programs, as well as asset management. Uh, five years ago, we developed our first forecast that takes a unique look at both retrofit and new aircraft demand for interior products. Uh, annually, we perform a holistic update, taking into consideration new products that have entered the market, as well as market trends. Uh, we utilize this data and our expertise to assist our clients with specialized market outlook for things like uh, forecasting product demand, market entry for new products, and strategy around growth and development. Um, we also work directly with airlines to assist them in selecting fleet types, um, cabin configurations in those fleets, products and services, 
uh, selections that align with their missions, um, as well as uh, competitive assessment on current and future routes, and ROI analysis on acquisitions and reconfiguration activities. So again, thank you very much. I'm happy to participate and look forward to this to the discussion today. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's indeed an honor to have you and uh, your interesting uh, standpoint um, between the, in, in the interface uh, between airlines and industry. Uh, with this, I'll let us send over to uh, Jerome from Fokker Services and please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is uh, Jeroen Moeker and uh, thank you, Nicole, for having me here on this uh, air convention uh, panel today. Um, my experience goes back about 15 years where I started in the aviation industry. I graduated uh, from aerospace engineering uh, uh, studies with a master's degree in TU Delft. Um, so I started in 2007 at Fokker Services and I started working as an aerodynamicist and as a lead engineer. Uh, one of the nice programs I've been working on as a conceptual but as well as a lead engineer and later project engineer is the ABNG program, which was performed for the French uh, Ministry of Defense, where we converted an entire aircraft from civil passenger aircraft into a military flying testbed with exterior and interior modifications. Uh, subsequently, I moved on to the NH90 program, which is a program uh, ran together by four European countries. Um, we've designed, uh, built and maintained continued airworthiness for this uh, uh, helicopter uh, together with the four countries. Um, from there, I moved back to uh, Fokker Services uh, as well in my role as business developer. And I've learned along the way how to be an integrator on aircraft level. So working on aircraft completions, working on aircraft modifications, um, it's very nice to do this. And it really helps me in my role as a business developer. So. If you would see on this next slide is a brief introduction for the activities that we do within uh, focus services like exchange programs, component MROs, uh, parts availability, uh, defense, aircraft maintenance, repair and overall. And I'm in mostly in the corner of aircraft modifications and engineering services. So what we do in the modifications is we supply our customers with beneficial effects on operations, but also on mandates for avionics. So we have a wide range of STCs for avionics, which is not only related to Fokker aircraft, but for the majority today of non-Fokker aircraft like Boeing, Airbus, CRJ, Embraer. Um, next to that, we do general innovations like cabin interiors, LED uh, interior lightning, but also like electronic flight book uh, holders in the cockpit. Um, Next to that, we are today working on our COVID packs to cargo. And if you would like, I would like you to invite you to visit our brand new website, foxservices.com, and have a look at our modstore.aero, where all the STCs that we present today can be found. So I'm looking very much forward to our discussion today, Nicole, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jerome, and thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I think, again, this will add an interesting uh, standpoint, not only from the aircraft modifiers perspective, uh, but also from the perspective of an TC holder. Uh, let us uh, now go on with Henning. May I ask you to introduce yourself as well? I, I try to. So, um, hello, everybody. Thank you, Nicole, for introduction. Um, my name is um, Henning Jochmann, and um, I'm the responsible senior director for aircraft modification. That means I'm responsible for all the commercial modification we do at Lufthansa Technik, uh, located in Hamburg. And um, yeah, um, I think uh, everybody is uh, well known Lufthansa Technik. And um, I want to highlight one figure. Uh, if you see that we over 5,000 aircraft under exclusive contract, uh, that means nothing less that we uh, yeah, nearly every third aircraft is maintained by us. So lots of experience, uh, lots of know-how there and um, if it comes to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about my department and uh, what we do in my department. Like I said, uh, we are responsible for the commercial modification. We do it in different um, um, aspects. We do it in the cabin modification, connectivity modification, um, of course, cockpit modification. And um, I'm very proud about it. Um, we have the CAMO of LHT that uh, is in my department and we can do lots of things with the help 
side of the KMO if it comes to modification. Um, what we are also very proud of is uh, that we are responsible for over 700 SDCs worldwide at uh, nearly 18 authorities worldwide. So you see lots of things we have to take care about. And um, yeah, um, that's one reason why I'm very happy that I'm here today and can talk about modification because uh, we love modification here. And um, I'm really looking forward to go to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Henning. And uh, indeed, we're proud that you joined us here today. It's, uh, it's some impressive figures also from the MRO side. Uh, and uh, yeah, last but not least, uh, Shawanta, uh, may I ask you to introduce yourself as well? Thank you, Nico. So I'm Shawanta Virasekar. I'm the head of engineering at uh, Etihad Engineering. Uh, we are a MRO plus a design organization. So I head the uh, technical services team as well as a design organization within the MRO organization. Uh, I've got 15 plus years of maintenance experience. I've been in camo, I've been in Aberdeenness, I've done a fair amount of design work. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are predominantly uh, supporting the MRO operations with technical services, and uh, we have a design organization that runs a couple of STCs on the side. I am also a contributor to a couple of EASA rulemaking committees, and I also work with SAE on some publications. Uh, who is Ithihad Airways Engineering? Well, we are part of uh, the Etihad Aviation Group. We are based in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. Uh, we do heavy maintenance, aircraft painting, repairs, modifications, and, and that's where the uh, STCs and the cabin activity comes in. We have uh, fair capabilities in component maintenance, supply chain, and, and of course the engineering team that supports all the activities above. Uh, we've got about 200,000 square meters of uh, apron and hangar space. We simultaneously run about 18 lines of maintenance, which includes three A380 bays. We've got Boeing and Airbus capability, so I would direct you to our website in case you need to get in touch with any of us. And if you want to get in touch with me, I'm available on LinkedIn and uh, through the uh, IMR contacts. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Shamantar. Uh, again, very proud to have you here. A significant player in the Middle East uh, in modification as well as MRO. So I think this is a pretty nice panel to indeed uh, shed some light on how a retrofit modification can support airlines those times. Uh, let us start maybe with the current situation. So when I look into the current situation, what I see uh, and what we all see obviously is uh, that there is airlines browning their fleets, uh, that there is currently uh, very much uncertainty on the passenger side, also on the airline side, uh, about the standards which might come up or not, which is not yet worldwide introduced. Uh, we also see popping up already solutions uh, kind of for the regulation, um, in, for the regulators from the regulation side, as well as from the recommendation side. So Chris, may I start with you from the IATA perspective? What do airlines really need most those days? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, what we, we have been uh, finding out is that there was, as you mentioned, there was a massive ground of fleet in, in just a few days, uh, I think in, uh, uh, around the end of April, we had about over 65%, two-thirds of the fleet was grounded. Right now, uh, there are aircraft coming back, but still the utilization is, is very low of those aircraft that uh, they're coming back. So, airlines uh, came uh, down really hard, uh, it came down really hard to them. They started looking for what they, they have to do. Uh, there were uh, many tasks in the in the AMM that uh, they had to work with uh, uh, and, and the MPD if some of those can be uh, ex escalated. So they have been working extensively with uh, the OEMs and through us and also with uh, the regulators on trying to alleviate uh, some of the of the issues that have been uh, uh, that have been uh, arising. Uh, in, in these cases. So, um, working through us, we're trying to harmonize some of those uh, uh, requirements, let's say, and also bring them equally in front of various authorities worldwide. As we all know, uh, the world is, uh, there is the ICAO that uh, pretty much keeps the uh, the world regulations and then under ICAO we have some major regulators that they keep up with uh, the various activities 
uh, regul regulatory activities. So airlines are looking for some uh, harmonization. We had to go and uh, start asking for extension of uh, license uh, of uh, licenses for mechanics, uh, certificates for for MROs that may have expired uh, in in this time, and uh, because of travel bans, quarantines, and and other issues, people were uh, not able to go and uh, and do a physical audit. Uh, remote inspections suddenly became uh, up in the front, uh, although we have been advocating for them for a number of, uh, of time. So airlines are looking for some kind of worldwide uh, guidance, uh, harmonization in, in these topics. Uh, we are looking uh, of a clear understanding uh, in, in cases of conversions from passenger to cargo. There's a lot of uh, lack of awareness, if you, if you allow me to say. In many parts of the world, they are not even sure how they can approach uh, that issue. In some other parts, they have been extremely efficient. Within a few weeks, they managed to get uh, through STCs, uh, service bulletins with the OEMs, they managed to get these conversions uh, to carry passengers either uh, to carry cargo, I'm sorry, uh, in the cabin, either on the seats or by removing the seats. Uh, but there is no uh, uniform uh, approach to this. So we're working to develop guidance in in uh, the IKEA side. Uh, you will find something called uh, CART uh, uh, and the take of guidance uh, for the industry. Uh, I encourage you to look at that and the CART report. Also, I encourage you to look at the uh, IATA website uh, that we have a lot of guidance with respect to, to airworthiness and to uh, uh, cabin clean, uh, cleanliness, how do you uh, cleaning and disinfection, and uh, also to modifications. We, we worked even before uh, this happened, along with uh, our colleagues from, from Tronos, to develop some uh, guidance material for modifications and uh, uh, we got input also from, from IAMA, which we're going to include in, in a second edition of that document. And ICAO is also going to adapt this as part of the airworthiness panel work. So there is quite some work that has been done and uh, still a lot of it needs to be done with respect to awareness and harmonization and collaboration between OEMs, uh, regulators and airlines. Thank you, Chris. You said some interesting points in data uh, on, on all the regulations and recommendations and, of course, the standardization uh, you were doing there in the background. Uh, Jeff, you're pretty much in the interface doing KMO services, doing consulting for the airlines. How do you see do the uh, when it comes to modify the aircraft to the new conditions? So what's your highlights? Thanks, Nicole. You know, to Chris's point, there's a, a number of different challenges that airlines are facing, and a lot of it is uh, based on travel restrictions and where an airline is currently placed and how they operate. Um, you have specific regions like Singapore, UAE, where it's they're really relying on international travel, and with restrictions and guidelines um, not allowing them to to move from country to country, they they effectively have in order to generate some revenue have have been looking at ways and creative ways to to transport cargo and those have been uh, working with OEMs to uh, to have interim solutions to remove seats and fly cargo in main cabin and even flying cargo in cabins with with seats remaining and then you have regions where domestic travel is still allowed and it's still somewhat active and we're seeing you know, some trends going up and the focus in those areas have been by the airlines mainly have been advertising cabin cleanliness and a safe environment for, for people to uh, to feel comfortable to want to be able to fly again. But again, with, with travel restrictions quite broadly still in place throughout the world, it's, uh, it's a challenge in, in moving aircraft around. So we're still seeing, you know, quite low, quite low um, frequency and uh, starting to see some reports on load factors. Um, we know some interesting things that are taking place with airlines that are blocking out middle seats and so, sort of some interim things. But again, as Chris pointed out, without having really any regulatory guidance in place, airlines are kind of adapting their own sort of solutions or advertising 
even measures that they've already had in place as far as cleanliness is concerned, but, you know, trying to do what they can to instill confidence in passengers that they, they're offering a clean and safe environment, both for the passenger and for, for crew. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Uh, indeed, you raised a couple of topics uh, from uh, disinfection, from social distancing, uh, passenger to Friday. She want or it looked like you wanted to add something. Yes, thank you. I mean, I, I want. I picked up on a word uh, Jeff mentioned: the, the confidence of the passenger. So, Im immediately after the grounding of fleets, the airline started looking towards the local regulators, towards IATA, towards ICAO, towards the SNFA for guidance on what to do and, and how to come out of this. But uh, it was a bit of a delayed response from, from the whole community to actually ask passengers uh, what they would want to see on the aircraft, what would give them the level of confidence. Because in the past, when we would uh, you know design a cabin for an, as a new cabin product, a new first class or a new premium class cabin, uh, airlines would spend a lot of time and, and efforts and money as well to bring focus groups into mock-ups, into uh, discussion forums, brainstorming sessions, to get a feeling of what passengers uh, and, and different segments of the traveling public would want from a new cabin. Now, that same exercise is required uh, for the post-COVID uh, aviation world as well, where a feeling of what the passenger wants uh, would be, would help us modifiers develop new products to innovate and, and to actually get those products on the aircraft. Because everybody rushing to do, uh, you know, to block the middle seats and to put these separators around everybody's heads might actually be a, a short run solution uh, because passengers might start asking for, for something different, which could be simple as just give me an assurance of a clean, sanitized cabin. Thank you, Shaman. Very interesting point, uh, uh, indeed. Uh, so, Mayor Person to Henning. Henning, uh, working for Lufthansa Technik and Lufthansa Technik being part of a large group, uh, including airlines. How did you guys take on the challenge on uh, COVID-19 when it comes to retrofit modifications? Yeah, that's a master question, to be honest. So, the first question that we had uh, at the starting point of the crisis was, uh, do we need modification? So um, is in these times, um, uh, like mentioned, uh, nobody will come to anybody to make a cabin nicer, to make something newer, like the big cabin modification we did in the past. So there's definitely not a market for such things. But um, we try to think about um, passenger experience in a new way. So what is passenger experience in these days here? The passenger experience is not a connectivity system or a, a, a nice cabin, something like this. The passenger experience in these days are definitely how can we make the people confident to fly again? And how can we help, of course, our own airlines, but also our customer airlines uh, to bring this confidence back to the passengers? And uh, lots of products are now in realization to help to get exactly that confidential back to, to the people, that they are able to travel, that they try to travel, and that they are allowed to travel. Because I'm pretty sure that there will be restriction for the next yeah, months, for sure. And um, I also believe that there will be lots of restrictions for the next years and maybe forever, um, because we have to, to think about uh, this crisis, but we have to think about further crises. I think everybody will, will know that this may be, this will happen once again, and uh, maybe we are better prepared for doing such things. But um, we come from the point that we have to bring passenger experience in a complete different context and to offer a product that help anybody to bring the aircrafts back in the air to travel. Well, thank you, Henning. Uh, it's it's good to know that uh, Lufthansa Technik decided there to go into development. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it's probably not only guessing of what the passenger needs uh, for getting back confidence. Uh, like you should want to say, it would be great to have also some uh, larger service on that. What does the passenger really wants? But in the meantime, uh, actually, the airlines need to make revenue. And uh, yeah. what we do and what all the uh, modifiers or many modifiers do at the moment and uh, also that was mentioned by Christian Jaff 
be uh, turning passenger aircraft into freighters, not for a long-term solution, but with very different concepts. Uh, I know, Jerome, that also Fokker Services is offering a solution. So how did you decide what to offer there? And uh, what is your take on that passenger to freighter? Yes, thank you very, very much, Nico. Uh, thank you all the others as well, because I, I can really... Uh, a join in the vision that you have. Um, so when we started uh, uh, in the phase of COVID, um, I definitely noticed there was a paralyzing effect on most airlines. There was a shock and most were too paralyzed to, to react in the first place. So for me, like uh, the, the, the look at this uh, COVID period uh, gave me another dimension of what uh, safety means for passengers. So we are very driven in the aviation industry about aircraft and system safety. This is what drives us and what we have to comply to in aircraft regulations. Um, but from the passenger's perspective, I would say this has added a different layer or a new layer where first passengers were very dealing with how safe is an aircraft, today they are really looking at how safe is it from a health perspective. So I think um, you need a very holistic view here to see how things are changing uh, towards the future. So we have a vision of about the short-term vision and the long-term vision here. I think for short-term vision is you really need to get close to your customers and really make an uh, inventory of what their direct needs are for this period. So you have to think along with them and to see what kind of solutions you can offer in order to uh, restore revenue as much as possible. Uh, for instance, uh, what we have come up with is the, the Packs to Cargo solution, where we offer our customers to remove the seats from the aircraft and to install cargo on the existing sea tracks for the time that YASA allows it to, to be in this, this intermittent period. And I think this is a really proactive way of uh, creating a way and means for airlines to uh, get some revenue, although they cannot transport passengers at the same time. Um, Fox Services has this heritage of uh, supplying these kinds of modifications for our own existing uh, fleet for which we still have a type certificate holdership and we can uh, swiftly act in these kinds of uh, uh, solutions. Uh, but in the past, we in the past five, six, seven years, we have uh, tr transformed our, our business from uh, mainly Fokker aircraft support into mainly uh, non fokker related activities. So we can supply all kinds of modifications and new solutions for other aircrafts as well, Airbus, Boeing, uh, CAJ, Embraer. Um, so for the short term solutions, we came up with the Pax to Cargo solution. And I think for the long term, it's very important to have a close look at the developments of the markets. So we are all aware is that the market is changing day by day. And I could almost uh, conclude that the uh, sessions and the discussions we're having today may be a different one tomorrow. But so it's very important to see what the uh, developments are. And I noticed in the past that while there was a, a paralyzing effect in the start and every country had their own government, had their own health organizations, their airlines, their airports, and there was no uh, uh, main stakeholder here that had a final say that flying was uh, uh, prohibited, that we could not fly anymore. So if we learn from the past, we could also see that we need a joint effort here in the industry, but also the external factors of how media looks at it and how passenger experiences is with respect to health and safety, that we need a joint approach uh, to find our way back in filling up the aircraft again. Well, thank you, Jerome. That's uh, some some great keywords, actually, uh, on the on the short term and on the long term, and obviously also on the joint approach. That is something what uh, we always advocate from the IMR side as well. Uh, so, Wantor, uh, do you want to add something? Uh, yes, Nico. Uh, just like Focus Services, ETR Engineering also jumped immediately uh, on on the projects. We we used our design organization to develop all three options that were being offered. Uh, under the guidelines available to us. So to carry cargo on seats, to uh, to use seat bags, and then to remove the seats and tie down or a, or a pallet solution as well. And we actually have 
STC is currently submitted to YASA for the tie down and the pallet solution. And we've got the cargo on seat solution with our local authority. And uh, this is working for us at the moment. And uh, having a POA and a, and a 145 organization together with a camo means you could react fast and, and get these products out to market uh, to your parent airline and to all the other captive customers that you have. That's done and dusted. And now we are looking at the medium to long term. Is there a solid business case for the airline and for the design organizations to actually push through with these modifications in the long run? Because we all understand that there was a bubble uh, last month or maybe in April and May, there was a bubble for cargo and there was a immediate need for medical supplies, for dry rations to be moved from one place to another. But as the societies adjust and as the world uh, sort of comes back to a level of normalcy, uh, this sudden demand will, will reduce. And also if there is a surge of airlines converting to cargo and carrying cargo on the top deck, the, the general price of cargo or an air freight will drop, which means everybody works their way out of the market. So there is a, a, a sense of caution as well when we rush into converting aircraft. And at the moment, from, from my personal perspective, cargo on seats or cargo on seat bags look like a viable option for an airline, especially for airlines who have wide body aircrafts, which is very prevalent in the Middle East. We've got uh, you know ultra long haul to long haul aircraft uh, in high abundance in the Middle East, and those aircraft could carry a, you know easily 15 plus tons in their belly hold, and uh, cargo on seats would give them extra ton or two, uh, up to maybe you know yeah about two tons extra, uh, which is a is a good uh, route to operate, and uh, it gives you good route finances. Thank you, Shwander. I think uh, you you all showed actually that uh, passenger to cargo modifications in uh, very different ways, uh, like following also the other recommendations uh, within that uh, is one of the benefits aircraft retrofit modifications by STC or by SB can bring. But as you also mentioned, and as I understand, uh, this is, uh, of course, hopefully a short-term solution. On the long run, uh, we will have uh, to dig deeper into uh, how disinfection methods are recommended. Is there um, worldwide standards coming? So uh, for he the health of crew and passenger on board. So that massively will also drive uh, the need for retrofits in the existing fleet. Uh, Jeff, what's your take on that? When you look into the future, um, midterm future and modifications coming up there from all over the world and from all over modifiers. So um, what do you see there? Well, quite frankly, I think right now it's it's to be determined. Um, I think globally, most people aren't aware of the existing filtration systems in aircraft. You know, the HEPA filter in modern aircraft recycles the air and purifies it every two minutes. Um, so the, the challenge becomes the economics that we that were built in aerospace today, as we know, you really have to manage about an eighty-five percent load factor. So it's it's pretty much changed to a, a dense cabin generates revenue in flying 85% or greater um, load factors. So when you start looking at um, cabin cleanliness and you throw in potentially social distancing, which is I think an interim solution right now, where you have airlines that are blocking middle seats, there's a number of different concepts out with barriers around seats and things like that. I'm not, we're not aware of anybody who's started incorporating any sort of barriers around seats, um, but the, 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 the blocking of middle seats has been extended, you know, first it was, uh, it kind of settled in through the end of May and now it's been extended out to September uh, for some for some airlines. But I think everybody's kind of just waiting to see if there are any mandates regarding social distancing in cabin. Um, some of these solutions on top of the current um, systems, you know, air purification systems within the aircraft, if there's any others that that um, proved to be viable, um, that makes sense to incorporate from a, a timeliness, from an economic position. You know, I think we've seen some studies where if we want to try to support social distancing in cabin, probably talking about a 40 to 50% increase on, on basic ticket pricing from what we've been used to. You know, are people willing to do that? Um, and then it, it also comes down to aircraft type, you know, 
there are some aircraft configurations that you can't block a middle seat because it's a 2-2 configuration. So do you, do you just run 50% of the cabinet? There's there's so many different economics that play into it. But I think, again, it, it all comes down to um, potential regulations and it comes down to to passengers' responsiveness once, you know, once borders open, once there's things to fly and you feel safe in order to you know, to get you on an airplane and you, and you actually have somewhere to go to and, and to visit, whether it's visiting family or going on holidays, you know, obviously we're coming up to the the, the peak of what normally is summer travel and we're seeing that uh, borders are supposed to open up in Europe potentially next week. So we'll be monitoring um, traffic and routing and load factors and seeing what the response for people is. And I think widely, as we've seen throughout our careers, airlines will be responsive to to demand. And you know, again, barring regulation and mandates, um, they're just going to play it out as, as how the demand goes and and what they can financially tolerate. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for for me, what comes out there is first of all, whatever. Uh, the industry and whatever the uh, STC and modification suppliers bring up, it first of all needs to be flexible and affordable, uh, for sure, uh, because there's uh, less cash at the moment with the airlines. Uh, another hint of it is you, you said that there's studies out, right, on, on products, on uh, how to ensure social distancing, maybe even without blocking a seat. Uh, all those design studies at a certain point need to be certifiable. So may I ask uh, Lufthansa Technik, so Henning, you said uh, you hold 700 STC, so uh, there is quite a few, um experience Lufthansa Technik has with certifying solutions. So how do you take on that balance to develop an affordable, flexible solution, which is of course still safe and certifiable? Yeah. Um I think the packs to cargo um, thing. Let me let me um, talk about a little bit uh, deeper about this because um, everybody's talking about packs to cargo, and we all know that at the moment we are working on the exemption of the other rules. So we do something that it's normally not allowed. So uh, in the normal life, uh, if you remove uh, seats from an aircraft, this is a major change, and then you are in an STC modification. Um, what we do at the moment, we use exemptions for such crises to do so, to transport medical equipment or necessary food or necessary cargo. So that's nothing uh, you can do um, for the next years. But what you can really think about is um, somebody mentioned 65% of the world fleet was grounding. So 65% of the normal belly cargo capacity uh, is not there at the moment. And if you look on the different scenarios for the next three, four years, everybody's talking about when we will have the same level of um, aircraft in the air and therefore the same belly capacity um, back to you uh, to use it for cargo because I think nearly 50% of normal cargo are transported by the bellies and so you see that there is a need for the next uh, three four years uh, to develop or to offer additional cargo space uh, that's why we decided uh, to go over the exemption for two reasons to um, yeah, to certify uh, the uh, packs to cargo conversion with the help of an SEC. We're still waiting for the other guidelines here, as everybody is waiting for such guidelines, but we see a market for this. And that's, um, I think, for sure, uh, what we have to do for all the other products. If it comes to disinfection, if it comes to separate uh, seeds with the help of a plastic ball, I don't know, to, to make social distance happen. Um, we have to think about a short-term solution that helps us during the crisis, like the exemption for packs to cargo, like uh, something disinfection we do very, very quick. And we have to think about a product that is um, need to certify, need to go the, the whole certification way to, to be uh, available uh, post-crisis, post the corona crisis. And I think um, there will be a market for additional cargo space and um, I'm pretty sure that we also need um, yeah, something like a disinfection modification uh, for the cabin um, post uh, corona crisis. So the flexibility we are talking about is very um, yeah, very important. And um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will see lots of, uh, at the moment, necessary modifications. So normally we 
from time to time, like I said, uh, we do unnecessary modification. It comes to a nicer cabin, for example. So uh, nothing you really need to, uh, to fly an aircraft. But at the moment, we're coming from the um, unnecessary modification to the necessary modifications. And I'm pretty sure that we will see lots of these necessary modification uh, for a long time in the aircraft. Yeah, thank you, Henning. So, and thank you uh, again for, for showing to the audience that's passenger to cargo, long term, short term, uh, that there is certainly is uh, a need for modifications in whichever way uh, those are then certified. Um, may I again hand over to you, Shawanter, because ADHAD and ADHAD engineering is pretty much known actually for exclusive cabins as well. So, um, what's your take on there when it comes to, to cabin, when it comes to cabin modifications, disinfection, et cetera, also from an aesthetic standpoint? Uh, yes, Nicole. So just like Henning, we, we wear the airline hat as well as the modifier hat and the maintenance hat. So we are very thoughtful when we bring new products out onto the aircraft because it has to be uh, good and exclusive for the passenger, but it also should be uh, cost effective to maintain in the long run. Now, we are working just like everybody else. We've, we are following the industry trends as well, and we are trying to innovate by ourselves. So. Over the last few weeks, through IMR, through all other social media channels, we've heard of people talking about uh, UV light-based sanitation and uh, you know middle seat blockers, the uh, re you know rear-facing seats. We've seen it. We've discussed it. We have been working on UV lights way before uh, COVID, and we've pulled out all the past test data and engaged with our suppliers once again. But there are also areas that haven't been explored, that we haven't seen much traction in uh, in the industry. And that's what the cabin crew is gonna do. What's the crew rest compartment gonna look like in the future? What's the number of crew who could uh, work around the galley? Is there gonna be any restrictions there, right? Uh, and if there's a restriction on crew in the galley space, will it affect the meal service? Is the meal service gonna be different? Are we going to have uh, you know a bread basket open like we had before, or is it going to be packaged food or, or frozen food now? So, Itihar Engineering is, is working with the suppliers, working with the industry to see how best uh, we could innovate and we could certify these innovations. Some of them are, are very innovative ideas, but they're somewhat far out and there are some challenges to certify it. That's what we are there for. That's part and parcel of our business. So, what we what we can certify, we will bring it forward into the industry. We will bring it into flotation uh, while uh, exploring all possible opportunities to, to get products out there. Okay, great. And we're, uh, again, pretty good uh, keywords there for how modifications can help the airlines. In this case, uh, coming back to the service and coming back to the in-flight service about uh, assisting the crew. Everyone is talking about the passenger, but uh, indeed, you're right. We should also have the crews in mind uh, and provide solutions uh, to make their life easier and as easy as possible and as safe as possible uh, to work on board. So Chris, when you hear all that, so from any other perspective, um, what would you, like to add actually and give our modifiers in the panel here uh, on their way uh, yes for sure I think you are uh, very close to uh, to the operators so uh, you need to consider what uh, what are their uh, consider uh, what they are thinking about uh, they are they are approached by uh, uh, a good number of people with uh, having all these innovations and these innovations are are very good they may apply under cert certain circumstances and that's how they got uh, along with them but some of them as, as as a major OEM told us they may do more harm than good to, to the aircraft. So we need to be very thoughtful on how we use them. Uh, first of all, the airline, uh, maybe with the help of you, if, if, if uh, of the modifiers, because some airlines don't have the internal capability, to do some rigorous analysis on, on what needs to be done. Uh, and then the next step is consult with the OEM. This is basic because some of the material in the cabin, maybe plastics that they, they may be, ex when they are exposed to UV radiation, they may 
they get uh, aged significantly uh, faster than than others. You don't want a, a cabin that it doesn't look nice uh, next time you get into the airplane. So uh, various cleaning agents that uh, they have been uh, proposed, they may uh, be good in some other areas, but uh, who knows when you apply them on, on a cockpit. So uh, and 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 the screens. So and and what would be the application uh, method of all these uh, uh, new uh, innovative uh, uh, proposed ideas that are out there? So uh, I encourage you to to work with them and collaborate with them uh, under the uh, ICAO umbrella with uh, the ICCAIA, the uh, the Manufacturers Association. We're working closely. And they are doing a, a tremendous job in speeding up, accelerating uh, all these uh, methods in order to provide back to the operators with some guidance. And at the end of the day, they have to be some of them. Not I'm not talking about each and every method, uh, but you may need to consult with uh, with your health uh, uh, providers also with the health health regulations and the airworthiness regulations in that area. Also, I would like to, to point out as a uh, think also about the, the environment and, and sustainability. It will come again uh, back to us in, in the future. Right now, uh, nobody can accuse us. The emissions are pretty much down to almost to zero uh, as the flight activity has almost stopped and uh, uh, encourage more of, of a collaboration uh, through uh, the agencies, the various agencies that are out there, the uh, uh, operators, manufacturers, yourselves as, as modifiers, MROs, uh, because we need that to, uh, to move uh, forward. Just as a, as a note, we have a draft uh, uh, about uh, uh, cleaning and disinfecting of the aircraft, uh, including cabin, cockpit and the cargo area. I encourage you to, to take a look and please provide us with any comments that we, we, we have. Also with uh, other guidance material that we, we have out there, because we are revising those almost on a, on a weekly basis, uh, to be honest with you. Well, thank you, Chris. Well, that actually gives me personally, as a uh, part of the IMR, the Independent Aircraft Modifier Alliance, some keywords to indeed look into and into accelerate collaboration uh, with the other, with uh, the OEMs. Um, but as we do have still some time left, um, that was first a very good point you mentioned, just Chris, is uh, how to include the the OEMs, and I think we do have OEMs with us in in the in one or the other direction. So uh, we have a TC holder here with Fokker Services, but we also have all of also technic, also uh, ADN engineering being a production organizations. So what is actually the measures you take and maybe maybe start with Jerome uh, when it comes to uh, test um, new mythologies uh, on your aircraft, in this case, the Fokker aircraft, but from your perspective as a TC holder, can you say something to that? Yes, yes, of course. So. For, for me, I, I think that the, um, the, the way of uh, safe traveling for passengers is not just related to being in the aircraft, because there's an entire journey where the passenger starts at home and he travels to the airport and the first thing he has to do is a screening on himself. So there's a huge responsibility for the passenger it's himself, herself. And when as soon as he enters the airport, then you see that there will be all kinds of checks today. So I've seen some news from AirAsia and the same is going to happen at Schiphol and that people will be scanned by temperature, by questionnaires. So there's one, two or three even checks before people will go to the, um, to the gate. And even there on the airport, there will be a lot of social distancing. Um, so the screening and the social distancing addition to the, the, the cleaning um, uh, requirements that uh, airlines have today with the guidelines from uh, uh, IATA or EASA, I think the risk and the, is very much minimized that people that have been infected by COVID or similar diseases uh, 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 is very low. So um, that together, so we have the guidelines and we have the intermediate solutions like the parks to cargo. And in addition to that, we're very depending on what happens day to day. So there's a lot of more research today on the effects of COVID. So can someone 
without any health issues? Can he be contagious to other people? Uh, are co governments working together? So are regional airlines starting up again? Because now in South America, there's an outbreak of COVID. So we cannot go there, but we can in the meantime, we can fly around in Europe. So I think our solutions really go down to the services that we can provide, the short-term solutions. And then we have a vision about how the world looks like post-COVID and in, in future sanitation. Yeah, that's, I, that's true. Yes, and I think with our OEM history and the DOA that we have, we can really quickly come up with solutions that really help in especially restoring this passenger confidence. But that's what it comes down to then at that point where people have entered the aircraft, but I, they have been screened already for a lot of times and they travel to countries which have a relative low risk of being uh, uh, being infected by COVID. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jerome, uh, for, for that view. Indeed, that, that it adds uh, the whole journey. Um, so, like, we are always talking here about uh, the in-flight and how retrofit modifications can uh, let, uh, assist the airlines. But indeed, it's the whole journey which uh, we need to look at. Uh, still, I'd like to hand over to, to Henning again, maybe a uh, uh, lost or close to lost uh, question there. Uh, what, what Chris mentioned is so, uh, that, uh, of course, the airlines are here and they're a bit suspicious uh, about uh, the new methodologies uh, to disinfect, to put on UV light and uh, to put on new chemicals for disinfection just to uh, restore confidence, but on the other side, not knowing what that might affect uh, on the cabin equipment. So I know that Lufthansa Technik also has some products in place uh, and is working closely with the uh, own product organization, but also others. So how do you actually test the methodologies uh, you like to introduce? Um, first of all, before I talk about the products that we have uh, at the moment in our testing campaign and how we um, make it make sure that we uh, don't destroy uh, any cabin furniture, by the way, um, let me add something we, we have to talk about if it comes to modification in the time of coronavirus. Um, uh, I think um, we have talked about cabin crews, we have talked about our passengers, about the airlines and so on. We forgot a little bit that uh, lots of the most of the airlines need help by the governments uh, with big rescue campaigns. There's lots of money, so nearly nearly every big airline is uh, rescued in any way by the governments. And there are lots of governments coming with calls with lots of new restrictions. If it comes, for example, to environment protection, and we have to help to find answers answers on these new restrictions, like if it comes to carbon dioxide, to reduce um, these uh, carbon dioxide, to, to do something for the environment protection. And this is, of course, something that we also do at Lufthansa Technik at the moment, because um, we, we were able to, to develop, uh, for example, a shark skin foil that is able to put on the aircraft to reduce drag, and therefore to save fuel, and therefore to reduce the carbon dioxide. But uh, at the end of the day, we have also keep in mind that we have to help the airlines in the way of how we can fulfill uh, the government uh, restrictions that are coming up at uh, lots of governments at the moment. That's also what we do at the moment. And like I said, all the other products we uh, are developed right now are available. So uh, if it comes to disinfection, there is a product from us out there. If it comes to separation that you can install a uh, um, um, a plexiglass um, wall uh, to use all the seats and don't uh, be able to wear a mask on the long haul, uh, um, on the long um, um, flight and uh, so on and so on. So there are lots of protection out there. But um, I want to highlight that we also have restrictions that are now moving faster than it was uh, before. We all talked about environment protection uh, before uh, Corona crisis, but like lots of the other things, um, things are coming very much faster at the moment, uh, driven by this crisis. So um, that's another point I wanted to highlight here. Okay, thank you, Henning. That indeed uh, gives uh, a very new uh, perspective here, uh, taking up on the environmental uh, issue Chris mentioned. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, giving us also the hint on the, on that file you developed. So I'm not aware of that product, so but I'm sure uh, we will find it somewhere. Uh, that sounds interesting and it shows the broad range, how retrofit modifications or so modifications on aircrafts which are 
and to be in service uh, can really help airlines to gain revenue those days to ensure uh, passenger confidence again uh, into also um, um, be aware of the sustainability of solutions. Uh, I think the whole panel also showed that there's a lot to do also for the modifiers uh, in, in the responsibilities of the modifiers to come up with affordable and certifiable solutions. Again, thank you, Shawanta, of mentioning the maintainability of solutions. Uh, of course, that's also something we have to keep in mind. Uh, I think that really got us a good range of uh, what modifications are capable of and what is um, doable uh, by mods, minor or major. Um, let me pick up Lars Bonnelis, the, the, the first words also from Chris, I think what you said, that we do not have international standards, but we go for. So uh, even that is something what we as the modifiers need to present. There is the transferability uh, of modifications and the applicability with the different regulations uh, worldwide, which is a challenge, uh, I can tell. Um, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for the whole discussion. Um, thank you for being part of it, for giving insights. Um, is there anyone who wants to say some final words uh, to our audience here? Any, anything what pops your mind still and said, okay, this is, I need to add. Shiwanta, was that a uh, raised yeah, hand? Just, uh, just a wrap up, uh, Nicole. Before COVID, uh, the OEMs and the modifiers were kind of pitching for the same aftermarket. But now with the need for, for so much of product testing for nano coating, effects of UV light and all that, the only way that we can get moving is to work together. And IAMA is a perfect platform where if testing is done in partnership with an OEM and one modifier, and if the other modifiers get access to that same data, the whole industry would move forward much faster and the industry would actually help the aviation community. So I think there's a lot of scope for, for IAMA and for any other industry groups of that nature to really make a difference during this time. Thank you, Shiwanda. Thank you for that call. I think that is really it. And uh, we are in this together. Let's approach that together. Okay. So, uh, Jeff, that was in uh, a raised hand. I saw that. Yes, yes. I, I think one of the things that we'll also anticipate is changes in cabin design. I think we're going to continue to see evolution of touchless solutions as well as clean surfaces and probably a transition to more light colors again so that people see that the cabin is clean. Um, there's a lot of, you know, today we have a lot of different pockets and cubby holes where things things can hide and you don't want to stick your hands and I think we'll, we'll continue to see transitions uh, to clean surfaces, lighter colors, um, and antimicrobial properties within surfaces. I know OEMs are working on those solutions now, whether it's in in plastics or you know textiles, the soft materials that we see in cabins. But everything that that a passenger or crew um, is is exposed to, we'll, we'll start seeing more integration and uh, design enhancements leading towards towards that direction. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Um... Is there anyone else? Yes, uh, I, I would really uh, agree with uh, with Jeff and Javanta. Um, let me add to uh, cabin interiors with with lightning, for example, uh, soft soft things for passengers to, in their uh, in their appeal. Um, we're we're working as well on the the cabin scenting, which gives another dimension of uh, experience to customers, which can also work as a relief and restoring confidence. And, and I agree that we should work together in, in bringing this back and uh, keep aircraft uh, and air passenger transportation in a, in a forward way, definitely. Uh, thank you very much, Nico. Thank you, thank you for being here and thank you actually for encouraging the idea of IMR. So more cheers, so because that is what we originally uh, had in our minds when we founded that association. Uh, so I can't see you, Chris. Anything you want to add, Chris? No, I would like to, not, nothing much. I think uh, it was a very uh, good discussion with all of you. I look forward to uh, a further collaboration. As, as, as you are aware, we, uh, we got your, your input about the, the cabin refurbishments and uh, we look forward to uh, working with you uh, in the future. Soon, hopefully, we will have the, the ICAO uh, uh, 
document uh, to support the work uh, with respect to, to the regulators, to the civil aviation authorities around the world. So uh, I am just really excited working with you guys and uh, I'm looking forward to further collaboration. It's a, it's a very good topic and shows that uh, uh, working together we can achieve a lot because we can bring some from, from the airline experiences and uh, consolidate them and you can work from, from the uh, MRO, the modifier side, consolidate that approach and try to find a, a good common ground so the understanding and awareness is significantly better between the two uh, parts of the, of, the, of the industry, the two communities that they need each other to, to, to survive and thrive in the future. Thank you, Chris. So, in, indeed, thank you for that. So, uh, Chris, that is what we really believe in, that it uh, indeed needs a team to win the race uh, and that it needs really every stakeholder of the aftermarket to work together, especially in the crisis like uh, COVID-19. So, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to my audience and to our audience here for uh, listening to us uh, for that hour. Uh, all of us can be found on LinkedIn, so uh, don't hesitate to contact uh, anyone of uh, the panelists or myself if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Bye-bye. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Air Convention Digital. Um, thanks for tuning in. This panel session is going to be covering the topic uh, recap on the greatest changes in aircraft leasing over the last few, few months. Um, evidently, it's been a I guess, unprecedented market situation recently. Um, a lot has happened through the industry in all aspects, um, not the least the aircraft leasing aspect. So this is the topic that we're going to be covering in more detail today. Um, I'll start with introducing myself and my panelists can introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Rob Watts. I'm the director of advisory at ACC Aviation Group. Um, we focus on corporate advisory to airlines, lessors, financiers, and also aircraft asset management solutions, um, supporting aircraft transactions globally. Um, perhaps I'll let Tadas start off with his intro and then David and then Marian. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Tadas Goldberg. I'm the CEO of AVM Leasing, uh, the company involved in uh, aircraft trading and leasing. Uh, since autumn last year, we have become uh, officially the part of the Avia Solutions Group, which is basically the aviation holding covering uh, all the 
possible services in the aviation except of the regular airline. David, do you want to go next? Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm Professor David Yu. Uh, I'm chairman of CAVA, China Aviation Advisors. Uh, we're the only um, specialized aviation valuation advisory firm uh, based in China and uh, located also uh, throughout uh, other parts of Asia. Uh, and we uh, specialize in other uh, advisory uh, services in regards to uh, and m and activities. Thank you. And Marian. Hi. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Marian Pistik. Uh, I am uh, head of asset management at International Air Finance Corporation. We are a uh, 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 a manager of uh, of, uh, of aircraft funding structures uh, located in Dubai. We put together uh, Islamic fund finance vehicles uh, uh, where investors pull their uh, their equity. Uh, we raise funding and structure funds to which we acquire aircraft, and then we uh, manage the management on long term leases. Uh, uh, currently, our portfolio includes 55 aircraft uh, on lease to uh, various airlines in the Middle East. All right. So I think. Um with the introductions, I'll kick off the first sort of round of questions. I think just as a brief background, um, yes, as I said before, the times have been unprecedented. In April, we saw almost 100% drop in international air capacity. As a result, airlines aren't collecting revenues, yet they have largely um, most of their fixed costs continue on, including payment of aircraft lease rentals to aircraft lessors. Um, so based on this, um, I think we've, I don't think it's any surprise that airlines haven't been able to meet their payment obligations to lessors. And as a result, there's been quite a number of lease deferrals. Um, so Tadas, I think I will start the questions with you. So um, generally, maybe within your portfolio, based on what you're seeing, uh, what percentage of uh, your leases or lessees are asking for aircraft lease deferrals? Shall we say 110%? <laughs> I mean, everybody came and, and asked because I think that's uh, that's uh, most probably the only uh, way to survive for the airlines. And I'm not surprised we we are having uh, big names and smaller names in our portfolio of 30 aircraft. But let's say all of them approached us. Uh, maybe some were swifter, some were a little bit uh, approaching later. But anyway, they they all approached because obviously they are not earning revenues and even in case of some let's say smaller regional airlines they, they keep on flying at some at some capacity but obviously that was not uh, even close to, to what they have been doing before so uh, to summarize i think everybody came and asked and then and this is a normal thing i think and uh, how to say it's obvious that uh, the leasing companies usually they are in between of the lessee and the airline and, and the financing structure behind depending on how it was structured. Is it just a senior loan from the bank or some more sophisticated vehicles? In our case mostly aircraft are financed with the senior loans from the banks uh, which maybe eases a bit discussions because we are involved just uh, with the bank. To find out the suitable cash flow plan for, for, for the deferrals and then and, and the future recovery of those. But then once again, the process, I think it was quite different depending on the financing institution. And I'm not saying that uh, somebody is good and somebody is bad. Uh, everybody's trying to protect their interest. Uh, but but my feeling was that the, the financing institutions, they were quite uh, not willing to accept the situation as such and, and pushing quite heavily, you know, to try to find the means uh, to survive for the airlines, for the leasing companies. And, and at some point I thought that, uh, well, I think it would be good uh, to educate a bit the financing uh, institutions that they are part of this game. And, and uh, I'm, I do understand it's just a business, you know, so it doesn't mean that uh, every, everybody should be equal and, 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 and play fairly in this situation. But but to me, at least it was uh, the feeling that, that, that this, uh, how to say, perception of the current situation from the financing institutions is really lagging behind as they are most probably 
uh, quite far from the daily operations of the airline and maybe at some point even don't understand how bad is that. Yeah, I think maybe historically they've they've lent into lessors and lessors has, have acted as sort of the first line of defense between any issues with the airline and them. And now that those issues are large enough, the, the banking community is being are getting a lot more visibility of what's actually sort of going on. And um, I guess it's a, a new reality for them as well. Um, in terms I don't know, of but get, get, getting such offers like, OK, you can defer the 50 percent of the lease rental. And when I ask you now who will cover the rest of the 50, they said you, the leasing company. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Marian, I'm not sure if you can comment on IFC's portfolio or just portfolios in general. Um, are you seeing something similar? Well, uh, I think I would uh, I would echo what Tada said. Uh, you know, every I see in the world, even those that uh, let's say may have uh, healthier finances than others, would have uh, 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 jump on this uh, opportunity to to ask for something. I mean, Churchill has said that you know. No good crisis should be left uh, unused. Yeah, so uh, you know uh, uh, <laughs> some airlines would uh, would see this as an opportunity. Uh, but of course, nothing comes from free. Uh, uh, so you know any discussion that would have been entertained at this point should come uh, 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 at the back of some sort of a uh, 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 enhancement to a lessor of uh, of lessor's position, and that could be maybe extension of a lease term, or it could be improvement to the return conditions of the aircraft when it comes back. Uh, so, you know, it's a give and take discussion and, you know, certainly in our portfolio, we do have some strong names uh, amongst the lessees who have uh, a strong backing of the government. Nonetheless, they also suffer from the, you know, complete uh, disappearance of traffic, uh, 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 which translates to basically zero uh, revenue uh, uh, amidst the situation of substantial high uh, fixed cost, uh, including lease rental. So, of course, we are in discussions with our lessees. Uh, on how to deal with the situation in order to uh, help them with the temporary uh, cash flow issues and, uh, and and help us with strengthening our position when it comes to a uh, when it comes to a uh, 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 return of the aircraft uh, in a time when we want uh, or uh, or a condition of the uh, of the airplane at the time of redelivery uh, to perhaps improve our our position in terms of making the aircraft uh, uh, more remarkable when it comes back. Uh, I'd like to also come back to uh, something that you mentioned earlier regarding the. Uh, the position between the lessors and the lenders, uh, because it, it very much depends on whether the, the funding is recourse to the aircraft or, or, or non-recourse to the aircraft. Uh, if it's non-recourse to the aircraft, it obviously largely depends on the credit quality of the of the leasing company itself. Uh, and there, I think, uh, there I think the uh, the banks would be tougher in their approach because they believe that it is the the, the shareholders of the lessor that should suffer. If the funding is recourse to the airplane, the banks are extremely well aware that uh, should they be too hard uh, in pushing their uh, their rights, they may end up having the aircraft returned to them, uh, 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 which of course is a situation whereby today they wouldn't find another alternative placement for it. So uh, clearly, uh, the lend lenders are learning their lessons as well, and I think they are also uh, uh, taking a backseat at this point in terms of enforcing their rights to the you know, full full extent of their uh, rights under the any any funding arrangements. And uh, David, maybe there's some, I mean, maybe just echoing the same you're seeing in sort of the Far East, maybe there's some different trends. What are you, what are you seeing out there? Um, I think first off, uh, uh, I would like to say, you know, I think uh, what we've seen and uh, what we've advised folks on, it, it depends whether the financing is, uh, has been uh, syndicated or not. Uh, right. So if there's one bank holding uh, the debt or financing or, or it's a, a group of banks or uh, even uh, broader uh, uh, ABS or other ET, double ETC uh, structures, which uh, are, are much more complicated uh, to get restructured. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, what I'm seeing in, um, in Asia here, uh, we really started seeing kind of degrading in traffic really at the end of uh, end of January here in Asia. So we uh, so I guess from uh, from asking for what we've seen starting asking for deferrals, rent deferrals or rent holidays or other kind of uh, amendments uh, really started at that point. And we are pretty much uh, starting to see the second wave. <laughs> Of uh, uh, of the of that t 
today as the first time, uh, say approximately three months or so, uh, has been uh, has been up. So today, um, while the various markets like China, for example, have the, the domestic market has come back up, uh, not fully, but they've come back uh, up to about 65% uh, of uh, previous traffic levels, uh, it, it's uh, it, it, there. There's still cons uh, considerable uh, struggling, uh, especially in terms of international markets. So these are kind of still touch points on the overall finances of uh, airlines and therefore lessors uh, who finance them. Um, I'd say generally, what what are you guys seeing in terms of what these uh, deferrals are looking like? Are they absolute deferrals? Are they sort of okay? We'll give you three months and then we'll restructure it over the remaining term of the lease or the next 12 months. Are you seeing sort of power by the hour agreements um, either within your portfolios or, or generally? And I can comment also maybe later on some of the ones I've seen. I think first of all, it depends on the asset. So it depends on uh, on how fresh, let's say, the aircraft is and, and, and how long is the remaining lease. Of course, on the, on, the, on the older assets, most probably the PBH is one of the possible solutions, especially taking into account that most probably the, the lease rentals are not so uh, not so high in the value. And then, then everybody understands that, you know, the remaining lease is maybe something which is also can be deferred in, in exchange, like, like, like Marian said, and changing the delivery conditions maybe a bit. Uh, and, and rather, let's say, stopping the lease contract now rather than waiting for another six months, which is obviously nothing will change in those six months. Uh, for, for, for the fresher leases, uh, well, I mean, once again, you know, usually everybody most probably starts with a 12 months request for deferral, no matter how big is the airline, how healthy, uh, this is like a standard one. Uh, some some bigger names they they understand that asking for 12 months is is not what they will get you know and then then on the next call they go down to six months <laughs> and then if the airline is really looking strong then you cut one more time to three months down i'm joking a bit but you know all these discussions are quite similar because first of all yeah you need to define the period of deferral uh, what will change in three months um Frankly, on the international routes, I don't think there will be much change. So basically, if, if, if we talk about the white bodies and the ferals on them, uh, even if the airline is strong, I think three months doesn't change much. Doesn't change much. Uh, on the narrow bodies, let's say it's it's maybe more uh, more flexible. Uh, at least my opinion is that the recovery should be uh, a bit faster. Everybody understands that. Let's say when the, the the borders will be opened up, so firstly the routes will be regional or, or domestic ones, uh, which will start to fly. So once again, I mean it, it depends on on the asset uh, on, on on the lessee, but but let's say generally anything in between three to twelve months, uh, and then then the other question is how you recover those deferrals. Uh, with the stronger names, once again, usually you ask for for starting the recovery, let's say from the beginning next year, and then and the deferred amount is is spread, let's say across the twelve or twenty four months period. Uh, in some extreme cases, you you might be spreading it up till the end of the lease contract. Uh, so each each and every case uh, it requires, let's say, quite quite. Uh, you cannot standardize the approach, most probably. Mm -hmm. Because it depends on, as I said, on, on the leasing contract, uh, on the asset itself, on the lessee, on the financing side. When you put all these together, it's 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 the result you're getting. And uh, I'm happy to say, let's say that in our case, uh, I think 80% or even more uh, contracts have been already settled with the financing uh, parties. The only portion I have in cases where let's say the deferrals were for the six months, uh, how how the world will change after those six months and and if the lessee will be back on track and especially is thinking that okay starting from next year or beginning of next year they need to catch up with the delayed payments uh, i don't know if they will be in shape to do that so i would presume that there might be the second wave of negotiations after you know after the relief of setting uh, settling the things for the first time and then facing the moment in time when you need to kind of start uh, performing under the uh, delayed payment uh, schedule and, and then the reality will, will show if, 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 if the lessees and the companies are in position to do that. 
Yeah, I think um, from my side, we've seen most of the sort of deferrals take the form of three months. Um, some absolute deferrals to be restructured or amortized over the following 12, and some power by the hour agreements, especially with the ACMI airlines, so they could match revenue to cost. And then the gap that that wasn't against the sort of fixed lease rentals, again, deferred either to the end of the calendar year or restructured to the end of the calendar year or over 12 months. However, as you said, I think we're coming now, I think those first deferrals we're getting to about the three month mark now. So I think the world hasn't progressed yeah. that much. So we're just going to see continued deferrals. Um, so before I ask the next question in relation to that, I'll let maybe Marian and David chip in on sort of what they've seen in terms of structures. Yeah, yeah I will readily uh, 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 contribute uh, to this topic. Uh, uh, having been involved in uh, in 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 lease rental uh, 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 renegotiations, not only this round but also previously, uh, uh, in, rela in relation to 9/11 or, or SARS or even 2008 uh, economic recession, uh, it's always the same story. Uh, and my uh, my position as a lessor uh, would always have been: uh, show me a detailed plan on how you wish to recover, how you plan to recapitalize yourself as an airline. Because not all help can come from rental reduction, whether it's three months, six months, or even twelve months. Yeah, uh, the airline needs to uh, needs to have a credible plan for going forward uh, before getting anything back, because uh, otherwise it's just buying time for the uh, uh, for the inevitable demise. Uh, so uh, you know, my advice uh, 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 would have always been: uh, uh, show us a detailed plan uh, 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 prepared by a credible. Uh, Credible uh, name ACC or somebody else, uh, uh, which would which would demonstrate to us that that you know what you're doing. Uh, 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 I also believe that the airlines that have uh, somehow secured uh, uh, some sort of a government funding in the pipeline uh, would have a better chance of negotiating and asking uh, for deferrals than those that have not, because those probably might be would be buying time already. So. Uh, uh, our position is, uh, and, and always have been, uh, show us the plan. How are you going to recover? How are you going to uh, get funding? How are you going to defer the obligations you have made to, uh, for yourself to uh, manufacturers for new aircraft deliveries that you don't need? And, uh, and, uh, and I probably would have rather seen a cancellations of orders or deferral of those before stretching a hand to a lessor and asking for uh, rental reductions today. Uh, because it all comes to the same, same cash, flow, uh, cash flow scenario whereby the airline needs to know exactly where to cut costs and how to get extra funding before asking me for uh, chipping into my pocket and, and, and extending some sort of gesture for three months or six months or longer. Uh, maybe you want to, you know, go the Scandinavian route, um, end up owning some airlines. Yeah, that's the long term <laughs> plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's. Uh... Yeah, no, uh, for for those uh, who didn't know, a lot of uh, Boca, et cetera, have uh, now are big shareholders of uh, Norwegian. <laughs> um, so I, I guess my my comment to that is uh, to, uh, and I, I agree with both of you guys and your thought processes. I would say the point is, is airlines, uh, they while they are suffering, and we all understand that, um, it might not be in the realms from a uh, lessor's actionable point of view uh, because of the underlying uh, capital financial structures that are uh, behind uh, each of the leases. So uh, uh, there might be a strings of decisions that need to be uh, made and considered before anything can even be done. Uh, that's first off. And uh, with all most of these, it, it, there's nothing free in this world, right? So uh, you can't expect people to just say, hey, we you should just give up, you know, X number of months of rent uh, and, and just give it up and we'll, we'll, we'll give you an IOU. You know, there is something, it has to be a, a, a give or take. Um, and and, and uh, uh, Marion, I think you're right. It's uh, what what's your game plan as a, as a airline overall? What other kind of uh, uh, financial uh, uh, plans do you have in, in terms of getting the uh, cash available to sustain your operations, et cetera? Uh, these are things that we've uh, helped a, a lot with uh, recently. And, and, and frankly, this is what I've been advocating since since beginning of February uh, in some op-eds I've been writing at Nikkei Asian Review. 
uh, people need to find cash to say this is not going to be a short term issue. It's going to be it's going to continue on. So as of today, it's still going on. So we, there needs to be ways to uh, not only coming from senior secured lenders or operating leases uh, companies or financial lease uh, parties. It really has to be coming from all different uh, parts of the asset uh, asset uh, stack, all the different uh, lenders and equity folks, et cetera. It has to be shared. So these are all things that needs to be considered before any decision can be made from either a lessor's point of view or other financiers' point of view. I think that I guess ties into the my next question really is obviously um, the deferrals are continuing. There's going to be more deferrals. They're going to be sort of recompensated in one way, hopefully. Um, but then again, I mean, this is less cash into less source pockets and therefore challenges in meeting the debt obligations back to lenders. Um, how long can less source continue to draw capital um, from their existing lenders or capital markets um, until the, the markets dry up um, and deplete their cash balances um, in relation to airlines not being able to meet theirs? I'm not sure who wants to have a crack at this one. It's a bit of a, I guess maybe a tricky one. Uh, why don't I uh, start first and go the other way? Um, basically, what I've seen in the capital markets is uh, banks, uh, if you don't have committed financing, uh, banks have been more skittish uh, and selective in terms of uh, extending credit for deals, for new deals. Um, uh, that being said, folks who have existing uh, warehouse facilities or other types of facilities that they can draw upon uh, can still do do so under their, their terms and conditions. Um, the uh, ABS, uh, double ETC markets uh, um, have really paused at the moment. Uh, and that is uh, something that has been very, very hot uh, in the last uh, few years in terms of funding. Uh, and we uh, basically expect that just like previous uh, times, there, there should be step up from, from uh, export uh, credit agencies, ECAs, to step up and, and try to fill some of this gap in terms of uh, financing needs uh, uh, from an airline's point of view. And uh, you know, you can see in this round, there is uh, plenty of uh, government support, not uh, distributed equally <laughs> uh, around the world. Uh, actually, just uh, a few uh, hours ago, Hong Kong just released its support of Cathay, uh, basically 30 billion Hong Kong dollars for 6% uh, of their uh, stake. So uh, this still continues on uh, today. So it's. Uh, and it's something that still kind of uh, uh, keeps going and it could uh, change uh, uh, as we progress. Maybe just to add, and when, when we speak about the government support, and I've seen the cases when maybe it was more marketing than the real support, especially when, when somebody posts that, okay, government will give this amount and that amount to support the aviation, but then you turn back to the government on the airlines and ask uh, if, if, if they have seen that money. So uh, even a month or two after posting the article, they were still struggling to see any any single dollar. <laughs> I mean, I do understand that yeah. maybe financing from government takes time, you know, and then for that they need to, to adjust something. But I mean, uh, for me, it was a lesson learned that, you know, if, if, if it's somebody posted officially that government is supporting something, it doesn't mean that really those dollars uh, are already in the, in, in the pockets of the airlines. And then I think uh, what comes to Lesors, I was surprised because some of the Lesors, even back in, back in March, when it was obvious that, you know, something big is happening, were calling me, uh, starting to share the views on the portfolio, how do they restructure and everything. And still, uh, towards the end of the call, there was the questions like, but you know, we still have some money to spend. Uh, do you have anything to sell? <laughs> and I was a little bit <laughs> caught by surprise if, you know, Selling is good, I mean, <laughs> especially in the environment like this. But uh, of course, those discussions never went to the level of, of, of discussing any particular deal because once again, the market values or all the values in the current market, uh, I think nobody is, is really 
having a, 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 a grab on that and, 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 and God knows where those values are and, and how they will recover once again, depending on many things. But let's say, even in, as I said, in, even in March and April, I've seen quite many resources still willing to spend the raised money in quite big amounts uh, rather than, you know, I don't know, to think of, of the plan B. Like it, it looked like they, from the inertia, they were still keeping the same pace, like 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 towards the end of the year, you know, and, and still, you know, that was a little bit surprising to me. If I can uh, contribute to this one, uh, I think this crisis will be remembered uh, as the one where the source really uh, 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 have navigated through it uh, rather well. Um, and I think it's a, it's a consequence of several uh, 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 positive trends. Uh, number one, less source have learned from the previous crisis and have uh, secured uh, substantial lines of credits that uh, were tapped immediately as the situation has worsened. Uh, 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 many lessors have had hundreds of millions of dollars of available non-recourse funding that they were able to uh, to uh, to uh, to call uh, when they needed. The second one was the timing. Uh, 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 most lessors had a very profitable year. Uh, uh, they were uh, uh, about to distribute the profits to the uh, to the shareholders uh, uh, when the crisis happened. The uh, the the dividend payment was uh, was put on hold, uh, which means that cash is available uh, to. Uh, to support the, the 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 negative cash flow probably for the first second and uh, oh, second and third quarter of this year, uh, uh, and also lessors have a very uh, largely profitable uh, business platform where uh, margins have been extremely healthy, and uh, and uh, and and some sort of rental adjustments or deferrals will not necessarily chip into the to the to the fundamental. Uh, profitability uh, or successful business model of uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, a leasing company. Now, that doesn't apply to everyone. Uh, obviously, size matters. Uh, a diversification uh, is, is important. Uh, ability to manage credit exposure, uh, but those are basic asset management uh, uh, tools that the lessors would have uh, would have been familiar with and and would have structured their portfolio in a way that they could manage the uh, the situation. So, I don't think many lessors will 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 will, will suffer. Tremendous pain, and I don't think we will see many lessors disappear. Uh, there will be some consolidation. I think that's a question that will come up later in this discussion. But uh, but I don't I don't I don't see any uh, uh, major news coming out of the market about uh, lessors uh, lessors bankruptcy or insolvency. I think that um, probably segues nicely into the M and A topic with with lessors. Um, obviously, at the start of the year and and throughout last year, the market was really hot. Uh, capital was just pouring into it. Um, a lot of new entrants as well. Um, perhaps this is probably shaking that up. Um, there will be some lessors who are less well diversified, have had sort of less access to lines of credit, probably in a bit tougher spots. And then on top of that, new investors who maybe have been spooked. Um, do you guys think that this market situation is going to drive uh, further M&A activity in the leasing market? Um, maybe Tadas, maybe you want to start and we'll kick it off around the circle the other way. I think in any kind of market, there is a possibility of M&A, depending if, 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 if there are guys willing to, to get some value out of that. And, and especially in, in the current market conditions, some of the lessors might be uh, desperate of, of at least recovering something by, by, by selling the shares and the companies. And, and that, of course, can be like one of the things catalyzing the, the possible m and so On the other hand, uh, will it happen on the largest scale or let's say on the top 10 leasing company level side out? Uh, I think they, they, they are pretty busy with their portfolios and then and most probably, well, some of the solutions might lead to m and but, but I wouldn't expect happening that. On the smaller scale, let's say smaller leasing companies, once again, you know, what's the value of the leasing company? You know, it's, 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 it's basically your, your your portfolio and and, and, and your professional network uh, and, and, and the ability to raise the financing which which pretty much each and every leasing company is doing and I, I, I think uh, well somebody is uh, tapping into some niche markets maybe more somebody is using some more sophisticated financing behind but but then uh, well it depends you know all the, there is always a growth possibility during the crisis, which which I will openly say, let's say what, what Avia Solutions Group is doing, uh, not on the leasing business, but let's say on the other aviation industries. 
like ground handling or even cargo airlines. So basically, it's always an opportunity to 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 buy something. Yeah, I wouldn't like to say cheap, but, but most probably something which which is becoming distressed. And of course, that's the opportunity if you have free cash to invest to 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 tap into the M and A and then look for something to buy. But but I'm talking more on the broader aviation services scale. Maybe what comes to the leasing companies, let's say. Well, yeah, some M&As might, might might be there happening, but but I wouldn't expect it happening in a, in a, on the top ten level. Let's see. Marian, do you want to weigh in on this one as well? Yeah, well, I think everything that Tara said is correct. Uh, 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 I believe that there will be no uh, uh, mergers driven by uh, some sort of value to be created uh, by combining portfolios or or, or forces. Uh, there will be uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, probably driven by distressed sales. Uh, you know, on the three points that Tara has mentioned in terms of what defines value of a leasing company, you know, if you break that into a small change, none of them really uh, uh, are difficult uh, to uh, to find today without having to buy uh, a leasing platform and paying some sort of premium for it. You know, if you look at for management skills, I think there will be a lot of people on the market looking for a job anyway. Uh, Stemming from airlines, uh, lessors, uh, uh, lenders, uh, uh, you know, situation will be tough. Market will be full of people. Uh, 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 ability to raise funding, uh, that is going to remain uh, vested with the lessors as they are, depending on their relationship with the uh, with the with the with the with the with the, with the, with the banking community. Uh, and the value of the portfolio, well, who knows? Uh, uh, you know, most aircraft probably. In the short term, would suffer suffer a uh, a uh, value impairment of 20% or more, depending on uh, on their age and and uh, and the market liquidity. So you know, it's very difficult to appraise the value of a portfolio. So yes, there will be there will be there will be activity in the market, but I think the only mergers that we will see would be distressed sales, so where a leasing platform is in such a situation that because of the structure of its portfolio and credit exposure to weak credit, which didn't receive government funding to sustain their airline operations. Will put the lessor in a situation that it will need to. Uh, it will need to uh, uh, seek uh, 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 seek uh, support through uh, selling itself to a, a stronger leasing uh, leasing uh, leasing partner. But those would be the only mergers that I see uh, coming next 12, 24 months. David, maybe you want to comment as well from sort of a, a values perspective. Do you think there will be M and A driven? Um, by increased cost of capital in terms of the risk profile of a leasing stream, buying aircraft with lease attached at discounts to what they would have otherwise sell? Or you think lessors are not sort of willing to sell out at the bottom and want to hold on till the values recover? Yeah, I guess a couple of different things. Uh, first off, uh, a, a buying and selling activity generally uh, has a willing seller and a willing buyer uh, of a particular asset, right? And, um, uh, and in all uh, parts of the uh, curve, uh, basically, the uh, there'll be there'll be buying and selling activities. So I think it really kind of predicates on couple of factors here, really kind of looking at uh, who is your uh, underlying backers, uh, equal e either equity and uh, debt, because uh, obviously our industry is highly uh, levered <laughs> for the most part, uh, and backed by I finan debt financing of various types. Uh, I actually, th uh, I think of my, my views on this uh, is a little bit different uh, than my colleagues here uh, expressed. I, I believe there will be much more M&A activity in the next uh, 12 uh, to 24 months. Uh, I think that what, from what I've seen, we have not even uh, begun to have seen the uh, swallowing of their financing. What has happened uh, in, very, in, in many airlines and, and less stores is that they have uh, uh, either gotten some government support or, or, or deferrals, as we had just th talked about, uh, to uh, to their capital structure that they are, are holding on, even though uh, on the revenue side, on the demand side, it's pretty much flattened out. So this hasn't uh, hit. And, and, and for, uh, to the points about, about values, there has uh, been very little uh, actual transactions uh, since 
really this crisis. Of the, of the most of the transactions that we've seen in the last three months have before this, but so pre uh, pre February are really too far down the line that they will continue and, and, and get finalized. So that's most of the deals that we've seen. So really going forward is really kind of what we'll see in, in a more kind of real time. This lag effect has really kicked in. Um, uh, really today, it, it, it is difficult. You know, as a senior uh, on an a Uh, and I would say that, uh, first off, uh, it depends on your uh, particular assets, right? Uh, uh, the asset types, uh, because the older the assets, the, the more uh, that they, more basically that they have uh, uh, come in, uh, uh, basically have those pre downward pressures, uh, and as well as older asset types. So new, uh, what I mean by that is more older technologies have also uh, they they suffer. You can see that a lot of the airlines have started to uh, basically uh, be, uh, configure their own fleets and retiring some of their older uh, aircraft. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is no life on these things. There's no value. It just means that there uh, there is uh, pressures on this. Uh, and uh, you know, it's a regulation of how these markets with lease attached as a financial instrument or just pure naked trades. So this is also a, a big consideration. So um, so there's there's a lot of different touch points, but look, the, the, if you, from a mark to market point of view, a market value point of view, uh, we're not talking, uh, it, it's, it's, it's still, uh, it's, it's definitely come down uh, by, but it depends on what, what, uh, uh, asset it is, uh, and I would say, look, uh, from my, from our, my and our viewpoints, economic uh, uh, value, which is more base value, uh, it really depends on kind of longevity and how you look at uh, these particular assets. Uh, we uh, we have moved down our uh, values, uh, but it's not as uh, severe as uh, as uh, our base. Uh, excuse me, our market values uh, that we see, which is, which the main difference between the two is is really kind of the uh, the the balance or imbalance of uh, supply and demand uh, assumptions built into that. So hopefully that gives you guys uh, everyone a, a bit of more color. I think I can maybe comment some of the transactions we're working on at the moment. So the ones that we've closed have been those that were sort of well through the process um, prior to COVID. And so those have closed or are closing. Um, some of them that have been kicking off when things started have been sort of delayed and the buyers are looking to sort of use the delay and use the period as an opportunity to try and renegotiate. Um, assuming that the seller, if they back out, will then be in a much tougher market to dispose of those assets. Um, so I think there is a little bit of a lag um, in terms of the value uh, change in relation to the timing of COVID. So I think the values are obviously going to continue to drop as, as the, I guess, the time lag um, uh, hits the impact on the values. Um, so I, I think we're going to see further declines over the next several months. Um, I guess coming into that as well is you would expect normally that um, if airlines are in sort of distress, they're not making lease payments, that lessors would would come in and repossess aircraft and uh, try to remarket them. Um, I think the, the simple answer is they haven't done it because there's nowhere else to place them at the moment. Um, however, um, this can't go on forever. Um, at what time would you guys think that lessors would consider stepping in and repossessing the assets? Do you think we're going to see a lot more of this or do you think that lessors are going to prefer to maintain the status quo where their aircraft are on somebody's camo, they're maintained, and just sit as it is. Um, maybe, Tadas, we'll start with you from sort of the top. Well, it, it will depend on, on, on many factors. Uh, and then one of the things is, uh, of course, the dialogue between the lessee and lessor. You know, if, if at some point, let's say, lessee collapses, uh, then obviously, you know, or stops responding or stops communicating or discussing, then obviously that's that's a good sign for lessor maybe to step in and, and, and do some action there. Frankly, let's say across our group, let's say if I look on to, into our MRO operations, we haven't seen so far any big wave of repossessions, uh, meaning that, you know, MRO is involved in the, in the 
let's say, re-deliveries and, and, and doing some gamma or, or preservation or storage works. So the, this, this, I think, is still upcoming. As we all agreed, I think uh, the, the, the process itself is still on the way, as, as most probably it takes longer time, because for the time being, you know, to, let's say, stretch yourself and, and try to, to live for, for, for three, four, five months, maybe it's not the mission impossible, but, but then the, the, the real hit will be coming closer towards the end of the year, and then we will see uh, how how much how many airlines uh, will survive and and, and then uh, how many resources start to do the repossessions as as you rightly pointed you know what's what's the point of taking out your asset if you cannot place it anywhere so maybe it's even better that somebody takes care of the camo and and, and, and maintenance at least to keep your asset uh, up up to the shape and in a worthy condition. Uh, but but uh, my opinion yeah that it's it's still too short time. Uh, we haven't seen, uh, let's say, coming back a bit on the values, we haven't seen so far too many so distressed assets that that, that would be put up on market with a 50% discount. So that is not happening. On the other hand, uh, if, if, if you know, even even somebody tries to, uh, to, to, to send, let's say, reminders that they are selling something and, and, and gradually try to decrease the price, but, but I think most of the players in the market, they understand that, you know, that the prices is still going down and will be going down. So what's what's the point of, of, of purchasing something now? Of course, certain certain niche markets like like cargo, your cargo operations, uh, obviously, they are booming now for, for, for various reasons. And, and uh, this is maybe one of the segment which is which is at least uh, generating healthy revenues and uh, once again, the question is how sustainable is that and how long it will last, you know. Everybody understands, you know, that uh, starting once again, uh, the wide body international flights with the belly cargo most probably will, will, uh, will put a pressure once again on the cargo operators. On the other hand, uh, this is let, at least something which is, let's say, on, on, on the focus for our company. We, we naturally stepped in into cargo operations last year before even the crisis was on the horizon by doing some acquisitions, which we continue to do. So we acquired some cargo airline and we acquired the, 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 the cargo charter broker. So naturally now, let's say, the busiest time for us is, 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 is really looking for the expansion of the or the renewal of, of our cargo fleet. So this is maybe something which is a, a niche thing for the resource to, to, to put an eye on. But then once again, you know, it's not something which is, let's say, completely will replace the passenger leases and then and, 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 and just maybe he helps you survive a bit uh, or have at least some revenue streams in, in your portfolio. Yeah, I can say on the cargo side, both from ACC having a large uh, charter department, um, cargo has been hot recently, but you know we don't see that sort of lasting at the current pace forever. So I think there's a current spike in cargo demand. And then even on our asset management side, we're working on a, a, a wide body freighter aircraft transaction. And the demand for that aircraft has been, has been almost, I'd say, untouched, if not heightened um, through the sort of start of the crisis period. So yeah, I would say that's sort of the one, I guess, silver lining in the market is is a wide body freighter capacity. Um, uh, maybe Marian or David, you wanna you wanna comment on sort of the topic of repossessions and sort of what we think will drive or not drive that over the next several months. Well, uh, I think uh, let me take a first stab on this one. Uh, and not directed at David, but he did say that there was lack of transactions, so, uh, which is true, that would provide some sort of evidence of what happens with the market with rentals. Uh, I'll, I'll take that point. However, uh, uh, if you look at a, uh, a, a, a present value factor of, of, of lease rentals that are being restructured, uh, uh, many of them perhaps forever uh, will remain at those levels of certain assets. I think we will see a, 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 a uh, increasing amount of credible data that will point to a, uh, a value impairment of certain aircraft types. Uh, uh, and I think that will be further uh, uh, further illustrated after the representations, which will happen soon. Uh, uh, because as you said, Ropa, you know, less source today, uh, uh, have probably displayed greater level of patience than previously. 
uh, that could also a function of uh, of being unable to move physically uh, uh, across the borders, which are closed, to go and 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 repossess an asset and, and perform a repossession friendly or not, whereby you would evacuate the aircraft and documents and and and, and kits and and, and and spare parts and whatever. You may have a less or less facility that is logistically uh, impossible uh, nowadays because of various restrictions. Uh, so I think we will see that happen uh, as the market will uh, somehow come to some sort of equilibrium whereby uh, it will be easier to see which airlines will make it and which airlines will not. I think uh, uh, not every uh, every airline will receive uh, and collect uh, government support in cash, as Tadav mentioned. You know, there are various statements made. Uh, some of them will uh, will uh, will uh, will uh, will play into the reality. Some of them will not. Um, and uh, and the lessors will start exercising their rights, and we will see more activity in terms of repossessions, in terms of parking of the aircraft, in terms of engagement of common organizations. Uh, and all, all the rest of it that comes with it, with it. And then we will also see uh, uh, a decrease in lease rentals and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and aircraft values on, I would say, systemic basis. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a period of inertia right now, but I think, uh, you know, probably at the end of the summer, uh, we will see naturally collapse of some airlines that typically depend on summer season for, uh, for their survival. Uh, the summer season is not going to happen. So many of the sort of typical charter airlines in Southern Europe, uh, which largely depend on 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 summer traffic, uh, those airlines will will without the government help, they will not make it. And, and those aircraft will be repossessed or returned to the lessors, whether the lessors like it or not. Uh, so that activity is going to uh, going to be very busy. I think also I, we had the same panel about a year ago and we were I think it was sort of maybe in December something like this and we we're saying that at that time it was the largest number of aircraft entering the market in any uh, single calendar year so it'll be interesting to see how this year's number stacks up against that and I'm sure it's gonna have a large impact on, on values um, yeah David um, if you want to sort of take that one further Sure, uh, and uh, uh, one thing I think from a lessor's point of view, while they while they would want to uh, take uh, repo aircraft, uh, and assuming that they could get the technicians and and and, and everyone in place, uh, one thing uh, we all should realize or or, or note is that uh, the aviation authorities, for the most part, were not working. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you even if you could get the technicians there locally to get the aircraft to, and bury it back to wherever you you, you plan, uh, most likely none of the paperwork could get get done and, and the aircraft w uh, would be stuck there uh, with the existing carriers. So I think you know as we are now opening up uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, various uh, international borders. I think this uh, there will be uh, definitely more uh, instances of this uh, going forward. Um, one of the things we've been talking about, and I wanted to kind of make a point, is that values uh, traditionally appraised values uh, the, uh, has traditionally have a lag. Uh, my uh, so from my academic research. Uh, what we've seen in past uh, crises is is about a two, two to two to three years type of lag in terms of as, uh, values uh, from a high to more of a, a, a bottom out point on average. And this type of study is is uh, is uh, is not just my uh, figures. This is a uh, industry wide study that uh, is uh, as part of my book that I'm. Uh, Publishing that's coming out with Paul Grave McMillan in October called Valuation uh, Air Airplane Investments as an Asset Class, so that you know folks can see for themselves uh, about some of this data, statistical data that's out there uh, about this. But uh, you know, I know we there's a lot of arguments about this. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, a job uh, exogenous uh, shock. To the industry is much much worse than of other ones. Uh, yes, uh, I, I would agree. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you have to look at previous kind of uh, uh, cycles uh, and, and shocks to see kind of where roughly you can run. Of course, you got to make your adjustments. 
but at least in terms of values, I would say that from from that point, that's a, that's a big and and that, and that goes along with with uh, the airlines financing spot, your lessees financing positions, right? If you look at like for example in the U.S., uh, the the current kind of uh, uh, the support is really kind of until 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 uh, September. So once the later, uh, I think uh, Titus mentioned this, we'll see much more activity as, as we get closer to the end of the year, uh, as, as some of these other factors we've, we've all been saying uh, come into more light. So I, I anticipate this, this is gonna be definitely some ramp up in, in activity in this, uh, this area uh, going forward uh, one way or another. All right, um, I think we've been at it for about I think maybe 50 minutes now so i know it's a a lot for people to be watching this on on video rather than in uh sort of real life and hopefully we'll be able to do these these events back on stage at some point in the near future um but i think that we can then wrap it up with everyone here i know the the forum is going to be on video there will be a chance for people to write in comments on sort of the chat functionality so we will try and address those either live or an email um, but in any case, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I think it was a really solid panel. I, I know I enjoyed it. And that wraps it up. Thank you very much. Aircraft are meant to be airborne. That's where they make money. Passengers expect a smooth journey. After check-in and baggage drop, the ground time is the critical factor where airlines, airports, and ground handlers aim for perfect processes. After landing, more than 200 different steps need to be processed to prepare the aircraft for takeoff again. These steps are preceded by different parties and need to be done in a particular time frame. The logistics is a challenge, and every department resources such as people and vehicles are limited, and requirements like service level agreements, government regulations, and many others have to be taken into account. Unforeseen circumstances can easily cause flight delays. Dispatchers need to change plans quickly, as a disruption in one process may cause further delays, resulting in a knock-on effect. If staff is not available or machines are broken, penalties might be unavoidable. Just imagine your processes are handled and optimized by using software. GroundStar is your solution. GroundStar delivers value to airlines, ground handlers, and all other stakeholders in the turnaround process. Its end-to-end -end approach supports you in your strategical and tactical planning, and in particular, at the day of operations. GroundStar is aware of all your resources, their locations, and assigned jobs, taking into account not only the travel time, but also the duration of each task. A powerful real-time optimization enables GroundStar to change plans automatically and provide an optimized schedule to efficiently allocate the available resources to the jobs. Let's have a closer look. Greg Groundster is responsible for the baggage handling. In the past, he used Excel sheets, paper, and radio to plan and execute his job. Once in a while, vehicles break down. In an ideal case, other trucks and drivers would be available to take over. If this was not the case, Greg had to check the location and availability of his other resources by radio. Additionally, the amount of baggage, all available trucks, and their travel time must be comprised. Under time pressure, a tricky task. Since GroundStar has been implemented, Greg is able to react to any changes in the plan within seconds. GroundStar considers special requirements and factors them into the strategic planning. On the day of operation, Greg can review all tasks and their pertinent information and assign them to his employees. As disruptions evolve, work processes can be adjusted in real time. 
and a fully mobile workflow ensures a smooth information flow between all parties. Be a ground star and rely on more than 25 years of worldwide experience. More than 70 organizations at 160 airports already put their trust in our aviation experts. As a ground star, you will reduce costs by up to 30%. You will achieve higher employee satisfaction by up to 95%. And you will boost your efficiency through our powerful optimizer. Find further information at groundstar.arrow.